The skeleton lay on the cold ground and raised his head looking at someone with his last strength. He was dying, but pulled his exhausted bones forward. He had a goal that was not meant to be reached. His mistress, Mrs. Succubus, was dying. Her eyes glazed over with horror. Her face was pained and blood flowed from her mouth in a thin stream. Burning with rage and the desire to kill, the warrior's sword pierced the succubus lady's belly. Blood spurted from the wound. The sword whistled and flew towards the skeleton, leaving drops of blood in the air. The skeleton was a soldier who should guard this dungeon, but he failed in his mission. His mistress lay on the damp ground dying. Around her, the pool of blood grew larger and larger, and the warrior who had killed her stood over her. The skeleton continued to pull its bones towards the mistress, begging the warriors to stop this violence. But his spine was pierced by the shield of one of the soldiers. The skeleton's bones crunched as they broke apart. He seemed to scream from the terrible pain that pierced him. When the shield was pressed one last time, the skeleton's head broke away from its body and rose into the air. The skeleton's skull landed directly in front of the mistress's head. She lay in a pool of her own blood, her body immovable. Her face was splattered with drops of blood. She looked at her skeleton and tears flowed from her eyes. He looked at her with bitterness and regret. If he were alive like she was, he'd be crying too. He couldn't protect her and was very sorry for it. In his last moments, he remembered her kindness and love for him. He was just as eager now to experience the warmth of her hands on his cold skeleton. She reached out her hand to him from her last hands, touching him one last time. The soldiers who killed them stood nearby and scoffed. Skeleton felt the injustice in this situation. Gathering its last strength, the skeleton's head flew into the air. She flew straight toward the laughing soldier the one who just killed Mrs. Succubus. Skeleton wanted to be at least a little stronger to make things right. He fell once more and pushed himself off the ground. The astonished soldier stood staring at the flying open mouth of the skeleton, unable to understand how such a thing could happen. A skeleton head flew at him. She was covered in blood and had her jaw open. A huge wound had formed on the soldier's leg from which a stream of blood was flowing. The wound was from a skeleton bite. The soldier fell to the ground and yelled about his sore leg. The skeleton's jaw, where the cloth from the boot was sticking out, was even more stained with blood and smiled with all its teeth. Skeleton thought only that if he had one more chance, he would make things right. Cursing loudly at the poor dying skeleton, the soldier crushed the skull with his boot. Bone fragments sprinkled in all directions. Dying in the skeleton's mind were thoughts of release but in the meantime, his new life program was being downloaded. The skeleton soldier thought about the loud sounds surrounding him. Isn't death so loud? But it was raining all around him. He opened his eyes and saw the sky. Water ran down his bones in large drops. He was lying in a coffin. He sat down in the coffin and leaned his hands on the ground. He thought it was his dream, scary dream. The afterlife can't be that familiar. As the skeleton looked around studying the area, a man in a cape with a large hood on his head came out of the bushes. An inscription appeared that said the data was Pelanized. A monitor appeared in front of him, spelling out his vital signs. He was a skeleton soldier with no name. Looking at the monitor, he tried to figure out what was going on. A girl's scream was heard from behind. She was calling out for some kind of undead. The girl's voice sounded familiar to the skeleton, and he flinched in surprise. The skeleton turned to her. The girl threw her hands up to the sky and introduced herself. Her name was Rubia, and it was she who awakened him. He was silent, trying to comprehend what I'm hearing, frozen as if he were mute. If she was Rubia, she's the same necromancer trainee who woke him from his slumber 20 years ago. The skeleton began to climb out of the grave. His bones crunched loudly from his long sleep. Skeleton thought about the fact that he had gone back 20 years after failing to protect Lady Succubus. It was the very day she called him back to this world for her protection. The skeleton began looking around again. He looked for confirmation that this was not a dream. Soon bandits will show up here and kill this girl. A lot of blood will be spilled and the skeleton will suffer. It will take a year for him to recover from this battle. Since the skeleton went back in time, then Mrs. Succubus is alive too. He needs to warn her of what's about to happen. The skeleton lowered his head sadly. Even if the skeleton goes looking for mistress, Will he be able to prevent what is about to happen? Will he save her this time? He decided that he needed to remember everything that had happened in the past. Was this girl the one he couldn't protect? 
By going back in time, will he be able to protect Lady Succubus? Rubia stood in the rain and thought about the fact that the skeleton had turned out to be mute. She didn't know that she would soon be killed by bandits. The skeleton remembered what the word perish meant and decided that he would not let that happen now. He picked Rubia up on his shoulder and carried her to cover. Rubia screamed and jerked her legs and arms. She was screaming to be let go. But the skeleton uttered only one thing. He would protect her. The skeleton looked battered, but he was determined to save the girl who had awakened him. He stopped and again said something that would protect her. Rubia froze with fear and surprise when she heard his voice. Was this skeleton really a talking skeleton? Ignoring the girl's questions and seeing nothing surprising in her words, the skeleton continued on its way. Rubia couldn't believe that the skeleton she had awakened was actually talking. Walking on the wet ground, the skeleton thought about the fact that if he couldn't protect this girl, who was he even capable of protecting? Abruptly, the skeleton stopped, listening to the sounds around him. A blue line appeared in front of him, stating that Rubia Ray's script had begun. He moved on. Rubia Ray was the girl at his shoulder. The symbols in front of him continued to change. There was some magic to it. Only he saw what is shown in the blue background. Rubia's characteristics were described there. Rubia's hood was soaking wet. She apologetically started talking to the skeleton carrying her. Smiling nervously, she lifted her head, continuing to dangle from her walking bones as she continued to speak. The skeleton interrupted her abruptly. He made the silent sign they urgently needed to hide. The clatter of hooves on the wet ground was heard. On fierce horses rode the brigands. They were looking for someone. Rubia and the skeleton hid behind a rock. A thought flashed through the skeleton's skull as he looked at the brigands. His skeletal memory failed him a bit. The chief of the brigands was handing out orders. These people didn't end up here by accident. They were looking for this girl. They weren't simple thugs, but professional assassins. Finding no one, they loudly said they were leaving here. But what bothered the skeleton was the thought of why were they looking for the girl. Rising from behind a rock after the bandits had left, Rubia rubbed her stiff neck. The skeleton asked her if she was a fugitive, and she was caught off guard by the question. Proudly straightening her back, Rubia declared that she was the Lord's rightful heir. At that moment, an arrow flew into her back. Everything in her eyes began to redden sharply from the blood. Abruptly turning his head in the direction from which the arrow had come, the skeleton froze. Between the bushes sat crouched an archer with a loaded gun. The outlaw's face read victory, they just pretended to leave. The girl was still alive. There was an arrow sticking out of her shoulder, which she tried to pull out. Above the wounded girl stood the bandit leader with a huge sledgehammer. He mocked the heiress. His face would be the last thing she would see, the villain said. He was the angel of death summoned by Lord Hyen. The girl was scared. The outlaw was examining his prey. He decided before he chopped her head off he needed to play with her, and gave Rubia's chest a dirty look. The filthy man bent over the injured girl trying to fulfill his lustful thoughts, but a skeleton was already standing over him holding a huge boulder over his head. In an instant, the stone fell on his head, leaving only a red stain from it. The girl shrank back in fear, looking at the skeleton that had just killed the brigand. The skeleton held out his palm with the words, Don't be afraid. He got down on one knee in front of the girl with his hand outstretched and talked about protecting her. Rubia stared at him, deciding what she should do. She doubted it, but just now he had saved her. The girl was grateful to the skeleton. There was only trust and tenderness in her gaze. She made up her mind and held out her palm to him in return. The skeleton spoke of their need to hurry. But before he could do anything, a huge tree trunk crashed into his head. Before Rubia's eyes, the skeleton's skull turned into small shards. In the moments before his death, the skeleton called her heiress. Rubbing her bruised head, one of the mercenaries asked the girl how well she knew necromancy. It was new to the brigands that the skeleton was so strong. That was the last thing the skeleton heard. He could no longer move. He was dying again. The skeleton was given a second chance, but it was in vain. He failed again. Before consciousness blacked out, the blue line reappeared. It asked if the skeleton wanted to remember its death. He was brought back to his senses by the sound of dripping rain. He lies in the open casket again and looks up into the sky. He sat in the coffin trying to realize how could this have happened again. He'd just been murdered. And again there is the cry of Rubia calling for him. She stands in front of him again, raising her hands to the sky. She just woke him up from his nap. He looks at her with a smile. And there's only one question in his skull. 
What's going on? The skeleton looked at his hands and realized he was alive again. Water dripped off him and he kept looking at himself. He was back again on the same day and all his memories were retained. Nothing has changed. Still, one thing has changed. A memorial hall of death appeared on the blue bar. The caption read, Thanks to the previous election, he got extra points. Plus, the necromancer girl had shown a liking for him. There was a warning that blunt blows led to death. Attractiveness points, resistance to blunt weapons, what do all these inscriptions mean? The skeleton looked at the blue screen and didn't understand what the bonus points were written there. That's when he remembered the moment of the blunt blow to the head, which caused him to die a second time. He had to pick one thing, but will he be ready this time? There are only two choices, either the necromancer girl's location points or strength to resist blunt blows. Skeletons are naturally weak to blunt weapon strikes. If he chooses damage points, he will become better at resisting. He looks at Rubia. He needs to protect her. Rubia was thinking like last time about the skeleton not being able to talk. But when the skeleton called out to her, she marveled at his ability to speak. The skeleton called her a necromancer. The skeleton pointed to a rock and told the girl to hide behind it. Rubia froze, not understanding why he was giving her orders. The skeleton stood in front of the girl, explaining why she needed to obey him. The mercenaries will be here soon. He was really asking her to believe and hide. She thought hard about the words the skeleton had said. Rubia looked at the skeleton warrior and asked how he knew they were coming. He couldn't tell her the truth, he just knows it. But Rubia isn't satisfied with the answer just knows. There's no such thing. But he couldn't tell her that he was already dying because of these events, and she had dragged him out here again. He could, of course, leave her and never die again. But then how will he protect Lady Succubus from the warriors that killed her? Suddenly, they heard the sounds of approaching horses with mercenaries. The necromancer girl was frightened. These must be the mercenaries the skeleton was talking about. There was a dagger hanging from Rubia's belt, and the warrior skeleton asked to be given it. He held out his hand for the dagger, promising to protect her. Rubia didn't hesitate and began to remove the dagger from her belt. She gratefully placed her dagger in the skeleton's hands. I ran to hide behind the rocks he was pointing at. The skeleton turned toward the approaching mercenaries. It's time to deal with them. The mercenaries had already stopped in the middle of the road, and the archer got off his horse. Looking around, he told the other that he was going to go look around. Seeing something at his side, the archer squinted and drew his bow from behind his back. Beneath his feet in an excavated grave lay a skeleton. Aloud, the archer spoke the same words about missing the girl. The skeleton warrior clutched his dagger tightly, waiting for the time to attack. As soon as the archer turned away in search of the fleeing girl, the skeleton jumped sharply out of the grave, bringing his dagger over the mercenary. His dagger pierced the archer's face and stained the cold steel red. The man fell to the ground and his blood spread on the ground. Standing over the slain mercenary, the skeleton was glad he could do it. All around, blue icons flashed about him, moving to a new level. Next on the skeleton list was the bastard with the big hammer. Before he could think about it, a huge hammer flew into the back of his head. The second mercenary crushed the skeleton's skull with his hammer, and the only thing the skeleton could think of was his failure. The mercenary, looking at the dead skeleton, told his partner that it was strange to see him here. There shouldn't be any dungeons nearby. After saying that, clutching his hammer tightly, he began to look around. I don't know if any more skeletons will come out. The skeleton lay on the damp ground, and a hammer hole shone on its skull. The damage from the hammer blow to the skeleton's skull, though it was mitigated, yet the injuries he sustained were incompatible with life. The mercenary decided that one blow wasn't enough. Raising his hammer above his head, he decided to wipe the remains of the skeleton into dust. The skeleton woke up in the coffin again. This was his second death immediately upon awakening. He was deciding what he should do. After all, they're after a girl, not a skeleton. He was tired of reliving the same day. The skeleton recalled what he had learned in 20 years of living as a skeleton soldier. He led a rather miserable existence. And dying over and over again for a few experience points was not something he wanted to do. Will the skeleton be happy if he runs away from this battle? As he sat in his coffin and reflected on his past life and the hard choices in his future, a blue screen appeared in front of him. The value of his strength, agility, and wisdom appeared on the screen. He was a level one soldier, but as important as a 38th level soldier. 
and he lied about his experience after killing the guy with the hammer. After the skeleton came back to life a third time, he killed the guy with the hammer. But the arrow of death found him. It flew right into his skull, once again killing the hapless skeleton. After that, he scored four points, increased health, agility, and wisdom. Although he remained a level one warrior, the importance had increased to 42nd level. By increasing his agility, the skeleton soldier became more agile. And now it was not he who trembled with fear, but the mercenary with the hammer. First, the skeleton warrior killed the mercenary archer. After that, it was the turn of the mercenary with the hammer. He was no longer afraid of him, but the huge brigand, looking at his slain comrade, held his hammer in shaking hands. The mercenary looked at the familiar corpse and couldn't believe it had happened. That a simple skeleton did it. While he was thinking about the unbelievable occurrence, the skeleton began its attack on him with lightning speed. The mercenary was able to evade the attack and even swung his hammer. But the skeleton deftly dodged it, making the mercenary sweat with fear. He still couldn't believe his eyes. The skeleton soldier clutched the girl's sword tightly in his hands and threw himself into a final attack on the mercenary. No matter how hard the mercenary tried, he failed to hit the skeleton even once. The one deftly and quickly evaded his blows with a heavy hammer. The skeleton was determined. There wasn't an ounce of fear or doubt in his eyes. The skeleton's final blow was accurate. The touch of the sword caused everything around him to turn red. The mercenary's eyes rolled back in pain and impending death. All he saw was white light and blood. My blood. The sword strike struck the mercenary's neck. Because of its size, it couldn't run or dodge. The skeleton stood behind the dying mercenary. As he held on his knees with his last strength, blood spurting from his neck. That was the last time the mercenary was on his feet. The skeleton stood between the dead bodies of the mercenaries, lowering the sword in his hands. All he could think about was that this time he had succeeded and defeated them. Rubia carefully peered out from behind a rock. She wondered if the carnage was over. Seeing that the skeleton had won, she calmly decided to come out of her hiding place. Proud of himself, the skeleton stood in the rain. He was covered in blood. But that didn't bother him at all. After three deaths, he was finally able to protect Rubia. The gleaming metal of Rubia's sword was stained with blood. Rubia came out of her hiding place and looked at the skeleton soldier. He stood in the rain. Blood dripped from his bones and sword. And on the ground in puddles lay the bodies of the mercenaries. Rubia stood against the skeleton. She held a rock in her hand for protection. The expression on her face showed incredible gratitude in her defense. The surprised skeleton asked the girl what she was holding in her hands. The girl clutched the stone awkwardly with her fingers. She said it was for protection if they ever got into trouble again. After saying that, both of them fell silent. Each looked at his interlocutor and thought about his own. Mostly their thoughts were on this victory and future adventures. Rubia Ray's data appeared on the blue display. She was a level one necromancer. Health was given the value of six, strength five, dexterity six, and wisdom 12. That's also how the attractiveness value came in. It was three. Standing in the rain, the skeleton went over everything that had happened so far. If he is killed, he will return to the grave from whence he was first summoned. Each time he dies, his level is reset to one. But all the skills and memory are retained. With each death, his stats improve. Thanks to these deaths, the skeleton gained a bonus level. He'll get a new skill when he dies, plus 20 points to necromancer attractiveness. The skeleton begged for forgiveness. He didn't know how many lives he still had left, for what purpose he returns each time after his death. Maybe this will be his last chance to stay alive. Rubia stopped behind the skeleton and gently asked if the skeleton soldier had been listening to her all along. Without slowing his step, the skeleton apologized. He was busy with his thoughts and got distracted. He asked her to begin her story again. They walked through the cave. The skeleton had a torch in one hand and a cloth bundle in the other. Rubia exhaled heavily and looked at the skeleton irritably. In spite of her displeasure, she began her story again. Her father was a feudal lord. He was honest, honorable, and his morals were high. And the girl's mother died in childbirth. A new heir has recently ascended the throne. He began to foment wars and increased military taxes. And those who helped him, he lavished with money and high titles. But low, noble titles stood in his way against the warriors. 
Among these men was the girl's father. And one day Rubia found her father dead, sitting on the floor. She stood stunned by this picture and looked at her father who was bleeding. The girl was in great despair, and seeing her dead father, she thought only of her world being shattered. She was inconsolable. Remembering this now in the cave on her eyes, tears came back again. She was very sad and lonely. They made a halt and sat on the cold ground. The skeleton listened attentively to the girl's sad story. It ended with the fact that soon the king would start a war. This will be a major battle nine years in the making. Shortly thereafter, the awakening of the sixteen devils will begin. These were all the thoughts of a skeleton looking at Rubia who was crying. After all, he is the one warrior who will be at the center of all these events. He's their harbinger. Wanting to reassure the girl, he told her not to worry. Now he would protect her. He can't prevent war, but it's in his power to protect this girl. Rubia stopped crying and looked at the skeleton in surprise. Rubia, smiling at these words, began to wipe her tears. It was unusual for her to hear such a thing from a skeleton, and the skeleton decided to get stronger. He will do anything to help this girl and one day meet his mistress Succubus. Raising a burning torch, the travelers decided to walk to the nearest village. The skeleton walked ahead, holding a torch in its bones. Behind him, Rubia stepped cautiously. Up ahead, they saw sunlight. The tunnel was coming to an end. The travelers looked at each other joyfully. Rubia shrieked at the exit ahead. They were so excited to get outside that they ran with all their might. The skeleton and the girl quickly ran forward to meet the light at the end of the tunnel. Once outside, they found themselves on the side of a snowy mountain. Rubia ran like a little child joyfully when she saw the snow. The sun was blinding my eyes after the dark tunnel. To the skeleton, the snow was just white ice. He didn't feel such innocent joy looking at him. But then he was suddenly hit in the face with snow. The throw was so hard that his skull rocked sideways. A smiling Rubia stood in front of him. She asked him to show more emotion despite being a skeleton. But skeletons have no emotion. The smile disappeared from the girl's face after those words. They were standing in a very picturesque place amidst snow and mountains. But the fact that the skeleton wasn't feeling emotions was frustrating. It was time for them to go, and they turned toward the mountain they were to climb. The girl seemed tiny against her background. The mountain was very steep. Despite the wind and cold, Rubia was sweating as she climbed up. They were on their way to Jublam. Climbing up the slope, the girl took a moment to catch her breath. There's not much left to Jublam. Rubia decided the first thing to do was to buy armor before Mr. Skeleton. The skeleton can't keep walking around like this. He draws too much attention to himself. The skeleton looked at his protruding bones and agreed. The girl asked for a short break. She was very tired but no sooner had she taken a step than her foot slipped into the abyss they had just climbed out of. Rubia opened her eyes wide, realizing she was falling. At this time, the skeleton swiftly rushed to save the girl. The skeleton managed to grab the girl and kept her from falling. He dangled from the very edge of the precipice and held the girl with one hand. Getting into a firmer position, the skeleton began to gently lift Rubia back to the surface, slowly, so she couldn't slip and fall into the abyss. Rubia decided to look down. When she saw the deep hole, she was afraid she might have crashed. When the climb was over, the girl knelt down and leaned her arms on the snow. She wanted to feel a solid surface beneath her and catch her breath. She was grateful to the skeleton for saving her. Rubia raised her head and said smilingly that he always saved her. The skeleton looked at her and was pleased. The skeleton reached for the bag he'd thrown off him in his haste. Throwing it on his shoulder, he turned to the girl. It was time for them to continue on their way. They were almost there. There's just a little bit of patience left. They were climbing the rocks again, climbing higher and higher, each time helping each other get out of the thinnest of gorges. They walked on sharp rocks, fighting the cold and bristling wind. There was a girl walking ahead now, and the skeleton seemed tired and lowered his head and weaved behind him. Stepping out onto the green plains, the girl pointed ahead, most likely the town of Jublam was already ahead. The stone walls and red tiled towers showed up ahead. They made it. They made it to the nearest town. There's not much left to overcome. The towers looked cold and completely empty. The wind howled as it blew through them. The girl stepped forward. They had already come to the very walls. She was glad they'd made it and decided it was her time to protect the skeleton. 
Unfortunately, a skeleton can't just walk into a castle, so Rubia decided to go in alone and return at speed. The skeleton was worried about the girl. He was afraid to let her go into the castle alone, so he made sure she was going to be okay before he left. Rubia exclaimed. Of course, that was the easiest part. It's easier than all the times he's defended her. Running towards the castle, she waved at the skeleton and yelled for him to wait for her. The skeleton obediently remained standing still. She was supposed to be back soon. She was so happy and tiny against the vast blue sky above the castle. The skeleton, raising his head and holding his sack behind his back, looked at his companion with great admiration. That's how the skeleton waited for her, hour by hour, day by day, and it's been three days. He waited for her because she had promised to return. Suddenly sounds were heard near the castle walls. The skeleton turned around to see who was coming. The headman was coming out of the gate and the skeleton had to hide urgently. He wasn't supposed to be seen. The headman was an old man who was driving a cart and muttering to himself. He talked about how hard it was for him to drive her and why he had to do it himself. He made it sound like there was a girl in that cart, the one the skeleton was waiting for. Poor little and sad Rubia, who has already seen so much pain in her short journey. The girl has been through so much lately that she may have decided to stay in town. Thought the skeleton chasing the bad thoughts away. He's nothing but a skeleton worthy only of contempt. But as she left, she spoke to him with gratitude of her salvation. She smiled at him. The skeleton decided to step forward. The cheerful Rubia Ray appeared before his eyes again, saying goodbye to him and promising to return. The skeleton stood in the burning setting sun and stared at the spot where the old man had thrown something out of his cart. On the cold ground lay the girl's body. The skeleton looked at that tortured body. Her clothes were torn and there were abrasions all over her body. She was bullied a lot and for a long time. The skeleton stood looking at the body of his companion. The sunset burned behind him as bright as his anger. Once again, he failed to protect her. She died and there was nothing he could do to prevent it. The skeleton couldn't protect either Mrs. Succubus or little Ruby Array. Men's voices were heard behind the bushes. They were walking around looking for something and were clearly not happy about something. One of them kicked the rock with his foot with anger. One of the men was talking about the girl who killed herself and was clearly annoyed by it. The bearded interlocutor immediately warned that their master would be furious. But the other, with a crooked face like Quasimodo, told of the master beating the man as mercilessly as a lousy dog. The bearded man was also upset that the girl had died before they sold her. After all, such a good product fell into their hands on its own without any work. But looking at that horrible face, it was a miracle the owner didn't kill him by beating him. The skeleton listened to them intently. But I couldn't put the word commodity and suicide together. What does that mean? Quasimodo climbed the bushes and looked for where the old man had dumped the girl's body. The bearded man couldn't believe that he was going to continue intimacy with the dead girl. Sticking out his tongue in pleasure, Quasimodo confirmed his intentions. He didn't have time to do anything with it so he'll finish it now. The bearded interlocutor called him sick. He was about to return to the tavern and pay the landlord for his stay. Only the grave can fix this asshole. Climbing through the thick and thorny bushes, the ugly man called out for the dead girl. His face spread into a wide and crooked smile when he saw her cold body on the ground. The man's face was horrible. But what's more horrible is that he was going to abuse the poor girl even after her death. Quasimodo stood there, drooling with anticipation. He removed his sword from his belt and placed it on the ground, started unbuckling his old belt to get his pants off. The horrible, lustful face was smiling. He wasn't the least bit disgusted at the thought of sleeping with a dead girl. Kneeling over the girl, he began to perform his perversions. The man was completely unaware that a skeleton was already creeping up behind him. The skeleton walked as quietly as possible to where the man had placed his belongings and picked up his sword. With a swift movement, he stabbed the man's back all the way through, so hard that he got to his feet and arched his back, screaming in pain. He screamed so loudly that he seemed to tear his mouth open. Bloody drool poured out of his mouth. Leaning closer to the pierced man, the skeleton whispered to him to hold still. One more little move, and he's dead. The man tried to turn around and see who dared to hit him from behind, but the skeleton made sure the man couldn't see it. 
Holding the sword firmly in the man's back, the skeleton warned that he would be asking questions. And it's better for a man to answer honestly. The man's battered face twisted further from the pain in his back. He barely got the curse words out of his mouth. Since the man didn't realize he'd better keep his head down and answer the questions, the skeleton made another sword motion. This time the man threw his hands up in the air and promised to answer anything that was required of him, just to spare myself the excruciating pain. The first thing the skeleton asked was why this girl was dumped here. The man's gaze was once again fixed on the breathless body. The man, still trying to turn on his tormentor, spoke of the owner, the innkeeper, who had brought the girl to them, and yelled about how he didn't know anything else. The second question was about who was bullying this poor girl. Her face was tormented. More and more blood poured out of the man's mouth each time. It was the captain of the guard who ordered them to abuse her. It wasn't their fault. They were only following orders. The skeleton huddled closer to the man and spoke even more quietly. Was what he wanted to do now also an order from the captain? The man sweated with fear and pain. He began to stutter. The skeleton recognized and understood everything he wanted, and the sword blade passed further through the man's body. Pulling the sword from the man's mangled body, the skeleton took a step back. The man collapsed with a heavy sack on the ground and began to bleed. The man realized that he could now see his tormentor and turned his head towards the skeleton. He saw someone in front of him he didn't expect at all. A living skeleton stood before him. The skeleton stood over the two breathless bodies. One of them was his companion who had brought him here. The second tough man who was prevented by a skeleton from bullying a girl after her demise. He looked at the girl with great regret. He couldn't save her, but prevented the horrible after-death agony. He decided to move closer to her and pay tribute to the one who brought him back to life. The sunset sky was burning with fire. It was as if she could feel the feelings igniting inside the skeleton. The warrior skeleton knelt before the dead girl. Her eyes were open. The words she was alive and admiring the beautiful sky. The skeleton covered her eyes gently with his fingers. It was time for her to rest. She's accomplished her mission. The warrior skeleton rose to his feet, holding the sword firmly in his hands. He looked toward Castle Jublum and remembered that the dead man had mentioned the innkeeper. A full moon has risen over the city. Under the cover of night, a man covered in a long robe moved slowly and silently. The door of the inn opened and a disgruntled host appeared. He was angry at being woken up in the middle of the night. But no sooner had the innkeeper spoken than a foot struck him sharply in the stomach. From the impact, the man flew to the other end of the room and fell to the wooden floor with a thud. The face of the guest standing in the doorway could not be seen because of the hood. The innkeeper's face wrinkled in pain. He pressed his palm against the bruised spot and tried to see who had hit him. A man in a long robe strode into the back of the inn. The man struggled in pain to get up. The innkeeper knelt down and bowed his head to the man who entered. He didn't understand what he wanted from him, because he had already told him everything he knew. The hooded man clarified what the man said and what he didn't know. Instead of a face, there was darkness under the hood. The innkeeper, kneeling on his knees, clutched his bowed head with his hands. He trembled in fear of the man standing there. He only knew of the two mercenaries who had traveled after Lord Erastus's daughter. He squeezed his head harder. How could someone like him know more? But the standing man kept interjecting back and forth about the words the man had said. The innkeeper realized that the man in the robe did not come from an organization and daringly raised his head. But the skeleton didn't like that and pinned the man's head back to the floor with his foot. He thrust his sword in front of the innkeeper's face so hard that the man began to shake again out of fear. A skeleton skull showed from under the hood. In this room, he is plagued with questions. The skeleton in the robe looked like death. He held a sword stuck in the floor and asked where the guards had taken the girl who had come to the inn three days ago. The innkeeper began to steer the conversation away from her and clarified with the skeleton whether he was her companion. The skeleton menacingly confirmed his question, but what he was interested in was why the girl had died. Swearing, the innkeeper abruptly got on all fours and tried to run away. A sharp swing of his blade hand stopped him. The sword stabbed into the man's right leg, pinning him to the floor and denying him the ability to move. The sword in the skeleton's hands was once again stained with blood. Drool poured from the man's mouth. The innkeeper shouted as loudly as he could. 
He was lying on the floor in a baby's pose, cradling his bloody leg. This time, the sword slid in next to the man's face. He cried in pain and hopelessness. The skeleton leaned over the man and asked again why his companion had died. Through tears, the man begged not to be killed. He promised to tell me everything. The skeleton was brutal. He gave him time to tell him everything before he killed him. The girl had only come to the inn for a set of armor. The man wept and spoke of how he did not know that by handing the girl over to the guards, he was condemning her to death. The innkeeper spoke through gritted teeth about the captain of the guard, selling the girls into slavery to the Necron Society. The skeleton had heard the name for the first time and questioned what kind of Necron Society the man had mentioned. At that moment, a snake pattern began to emerge from his veins on the man's neck. That snake moved as if alive and tore the skin on the man's neck. Bursting through the fabric of flesh, it rose upward. The innkeeper looked at the monster that came out of him and begged for mercy. He didn't say anything. The snake coiled around his neck and began to strangle the man. He begged for forgiveness to the last. The skeleton looked at what was happening and didn't help. He realized that some sort of spell had been cast on the man. After the death of the innkeeper, the snake returned to its place, back into the man's neck. This was clearly done by the Necron community that the deceased mentioned. The skeleton remembered the mercenaries that hunted Rubia. What was going on between the guardians of Ublum and the Necron community remained a mystery. It will take strength to solve this mystery, but the skeleton was still weak. Looking around the room, the skeleton in the far corner saw a set of armor worn on a mannequin. They glittered as if made of gold. As he came closer, he examined them and touched them as gently as if they were the world's greatest treasure. Looking at the armor, he remembered Rubia, who had headed here to buy it for him. So the skeleton didn't hesitate to take them for himself. He needs to get stronger so no one can stop him. He'll need them for that. Putting on a set of armor, he looked like a real live soldier. With his head proudly raised, he walked past the owner of that armor lying on the floor. Skeleton didn't want to lose anyone else. Standing in front of the open door, he paused for a moment. It's time for him to hit the road. He's ready. The skeleton stared silently in front of him. The sword was ready to chop everything in its path. That's what happened. The skeleton in armor chopped the skeleton in front of him into small bone pieces. They were flying through the air, but the skeleton warrior was serious and unwavering. Finished with the skeleton's body, he stood looking at the dead skull beneath his feet. He was a warrior. But how tired he was. He didn't like killing his fellow man at all. But it's only going to happen and now time is going back to the beginning of this event. The warrior skeleton walked through the dungeon and looked around. This cave was called the Ghost Crypt. Loud footsteps in armor rumbled through the dungeon. The dungeon was small and suited him just fine. The skeleton stopped. Another skeleton walked ahead. His appearance surprised the skeleton warrior. He came out of nowhere. The warrior skeleton was upset that the dungeon wasn't empty, but what his fellow man looked like put him in more shock. In front of him was an armed skeleton. In his hands, he held a sword and shield. He was ready not for defense, but for offense. The warrior skeleton didn't seem to notice the hostility in his counterpart. He felt embarrassed that he was about to stop in a dungeon that already had skeletons in it. He decided to call out to the armed skeleton and shouted loudly like a human. Hearing a human voice, the armed skeleton was surprised and mumbled. The skeleton warrior removed his helmet from his head. He didn't want to harm his fellow man, for he was just like him. The armed skeleton looked at the skeleton in armor and mood. It's sad when you can't speak and others don't understand you. The warrior skeleton watched and listened. He thought about how he had been the same before he met his succubus mistress. He decided to find another dungeon. Turning toward the exit, the skeleton warrior said goodbye to his fellow warrior and headed for the exit. The armed skeleton was surprised at this behavior. But no sooner had the skeleton warrior taken a couple of steps than a blue screen appeared in front of him, on which there was a message that the dungeon boss had appeared. This message startled the skeleton warrior. He couldn't believe that there was a dungeon boss somewhere around here. Hearing the loud noises, the skeleton turned around in their direction. In front of him stood a huge skeleton with horns. It was larger than a normal skeleton. His eyes and chest burned with blue flames. In his hands, he held a metal hammer and a huge shield. There was a bandage hanging from his bony thighs. He looked intimidating amidst the pile of bones. The armed skeleton cackled in fear at the sight of the dungeon boss. The dungeon boss raised his hammer. Blue sparks sprinkled from his eyes. 
He wanted to chop the skeleton in front of him with his sword. The other skeletons were frightened by such fury. But suddenly the huge dungeon boss was blocked by a brave warrior, a skeleton. But that didn't stop the desire to destroy. The dungeon boss unleashed his wrath on the armed skeleton and left no trace of him. The skeleton warrior couldn't believe that he had just seen a fellow warrior kill his fellow warrior. After killing the armed skeleton, the huge boss roared with rage and desire to destroy. The small armed skeletons threw themselves, scattering not wanting to become the next victim. The dungeon boss rushed to catch up with them. The skeleton warrior realized that there would be no agreement and put his helmet back on, ready for battle. The small skeletons reached the warrior and jumped to strike him with a blow from above, but they received a formidable response. The skeleton warrior repelled their attack with a single sword strike, and the skeletons scattered into small pieces. The formidable warrior. The skeleton lowered his sword and remained standing in a pose ready for any attack. He himself didn't seem to have expected to be able to beat them so quickly. But there was a sudden hammer blow from behind. From the violent impact, the skeleton flew forward, nearly falling apart. Rising to his knees after the fall, the skeleton warrior looked at his opponent. In front of him stood the dungeon boss, with a huge hammer ready to strike again at any second. Raising his sword and clutching it tightly in his hands, the skeleton warrior realized that he was the boss's next victim, and prepared to attack. He rushed to attack the huge skeleton with a belligerent shout. The dungeon boss raised his hammer to strike the small running man. The skeleton warrior did not have time to get closer, but received a strong blow with a hammer in the stomach. He again flew sideways away from the boss before he could do any damage. Managing to dodge the lightning-fast third strike, the skeleton warrior quickly flew under the boss's legs, cutting off one of them. The dungeon boss didn't have time to notice the movement and confusedly searched for the small skeleton with his eyes. The skeleton warrior realized he had succeeded in hiding and exhaled victoriously, but in the meantime got hit in the face with a hammer. The sudden movement caused the boss's leg to crumble into small pieces, and the warrior flew off again, hitting his back hard against the rocks. Falling to his knees, the dungeon boss roared with rage. He couldn't believe the mutilation he had received. Getting down on one knee leaning on his sword, the skeleton warrior realized that by cutting off one leg he would not appease the boss. The wounded giant skeleton began its attack again, swinging its hammer. But the skeleton warrior had his own plan. Getting out of the path of the attack, he decided to run in behind the huge boss. Quickly moving the skeleton across the boss's body, climbed on top of his head, thus causing the dungeon boss to freeze in surprise. The skeleton warrior, intent on destroying the boss, started talking to him, and his last words turned out to be knowledge of the skeleton's weakness. He swung over the boss's skull, about to pierce it. With one strong sword strike, he pierced the head of the dungeon boss and many cracks appeared on the skull. The warrior skeleton quickly jumped off the boss's head and a deafening scream of defeat rang out behind him. And notifications flashed in front of his face that he had reached a new level in his abilities. He took off his helmet to get a better look at the notices. He's gotten as many as five new levels, but one of the notices got him thinking. The blue screen lit up with a sign that a new quest had begun. He needed to swing his sword 10,000 times to gain a new skill. The warrior skeleton swung his sword in surprise. Is that really all you have to do to get a new skill? That routine swing counted. The warrior skeleton hesitated. If he swings his sword 10,000 times, his skill will increase. So he decided to start earning quantities. He doesn't need sleep or food. He'll be up to the task in no time. He walked deep into the dungeon, swinging his sword. He destroyed the master of this dungeon. Skeleton looked at the walls of the dungeon and decided it was a good place to train. A girl approached the entrance of the dungeon. This was the dungeon she was looking for. Behind the girl was another beautiful girl walking behind her, under the arm of a plump soldier. She clung to him and wondered if she would be okay in this creepy dungeon. The soldier assured her that he could protect them. The pretty blonde-haired girl turned to her companions and motioned for them to come inside. The sound of a sword cutting through the air could be heard. It was a skeleton warrior walking down the dungeon tunnel, increasing his skill. He didn't think the conditions of the quest would be so hard. The blue screen in front of him had already counted over seven and a half thousand swings, but only the ones where he takes strong and concentrated hits count. Looking at the blue screen, he pondered the fact that more than half the swings he had made. As a red notice suddenly appeared. 
The red screen lit up with a warning. There were intruders in the dungeon. The skeleton read the inscription and looked deep into the dungeon where these intruders could be. Three pairs of feet walked silently deeper down the tunnel. The man smiled. He talked about how lucky the girls were to have him. This dungeon is full of skeletons, but they have nothing to fear with him. The girl who had been walking under his arm earlier stopped. She was afraid she'd hurt herself being here. The man placed his bundle on the ground. All the girls had to do was follow him and look carefully around. Even if something happens, he has everything prepared. He showed the bag of red potions to the girls. They were healing potions, and he was happy to share them. The brunette sighed in surprise. Her eyes lit up at the sight of the vast array of expensive potions. She sighed so deeply that her already not small breasts increased in size, forcing her attention. The soldier covered his eye in pleasure, looking at his companion's breasts. Of course, it all depended on how the girls would treat him. The blonde-haired girl crinkled her face. His hints were very direct. It was immediately clear what he wanted. The brunette made a silly face and giggled. But the blonde had a cunning plan in her head. This man was loaded with money, carrying a fortune in potions. Clutching her dagger tightly behind her back, the blonde decided to kill the man when he faced the undead. The second girl also wanted to get close to the man because of his money. The last of her thoughts made the blonde smile widely. When her companions die, all their wealth will be hers. The blonde's name was Lena. She too made a silly face and decided to play Miss Innocence. Lena was in charge of intelligence in the army, and the brunette decided to overplay her by sending her ahead. Lena laughed. She decided to kill the bitch for giving up her position. Sparks flew between the girls. They were ready to tear each other apart for the huge bag of money that tried to appease them. In the depths of the dungeon, a skeleton warrior was preparing for the upcoming battle. He didn't know what opponents lay ahead of him and prepared for everything. Looking at the girls, the soldier drooled. He already imagined how he would flaunt himself in front of them and get to at once. But no skeletons have come their way yet. The girls noticed this and decided to rebuke the soldier, for he had promised them undead. The brunette glanced to the side thoughtfully. They've been walking around here for a while but haven't seen anyone. The soldier sweated from the awkwardness of the situation, hurriedly assuring the girls that as soon as they walked deeper into the cave, the skeletons would appear. And he himself was afraid that there had been a cleanup recently and there was no one left here. But then the brunette saw someone and pointed her finger forward with a loud shout. In front of them lay a huge pile of bones that was left from the dungeon boss. The dungeon boss was so huge that his body blocked most of the passage and his head was the size of a soldier. The soldier went cold with fear looking at those bones. He didn't understand why this monster was already dead. The brunette bent over the dead skeleton without any fear. She wondered if someone had killed him or if he had died on his own. The smile disappeared from the blonde's face. If the skeleton is dead, the riches will be harder to get to. The soldier scratched the back of his head. Most likely someone got here before they did. The blonde decided to act immediately. While the soldier is confused, she will attack him from behind. A warrior, a skeleton in his gear, stealthily approached the young men. Everyone turned their attention to him abruptly. Taking the hammer in his hands, the soldier made a menacing appearance and asked who had come to them. The warrior, a skeleton in armor and helmet, looked like an intimidating man. Nothing about him gave away the undead. The soldier struck a pose for defense. He was scared. After all, the warrior standing in front of him could kill the dungeon master. Lena wasn't stupid and immediately thought it might be a skeleton. The brunette, on the other hand, was very frightened and called the warrior a monster. Those words really rattled me with fear. Wanting to calm both himself and the girls, he began to drive the bad thoughts away from him. Which skeleton will wear the armor? The warrior skeleton interrupted their discussions. He occupied this dungeon and told the named guests to get out of here. The soldier was completely speechless. This soldier looked much stronger than him, and he didn't feel like fighting him at all. He turned back to his companions and decided to gently smooth things over by saying that it was time to leave since the place was already occupied. The skeleton watched them silently. But Lena wasn't willing to give up so quickly. She started yelling at the warrior. This dungeon was reserved for them. And this warrior has no respect for women if he doesn't take off his helmet in front of them. She screamed and wanted to throw herself at the warrior. In her opinion, he should have given them everything he'd looted. 
Lena threatened the warrior with the soldier. Her companions tried with all their might to calm and detain her. The girl turned her attention sharply to the soldier. She made the most innocent and pleading face before him, asking him to destroy the warrior. The soldier did not expect to hear such words and froze in surprise. These words and the sight of the innocent girl caused the soldier to act and he began to threaten the warrior. Knights cannot be so disrespectful to those who speak to them. The skeleton warrior did not argue with them and agreed to fulfill their request. Lena stood behind the soldier's back. She decided to enrich herself twice as much at the expense of the warrior they met. The skeleton, meanwhile, was removing his helmet. The expression on the soldiers and the brunette's faces changed abruptly, and they shrieked in surprise. Lena, who was looking the other way, turned her head, and she too cried out in surprise with her mouth wide open. In front of them stood a living skeleton dressed in armor. There was a skeleton standing in front of the people. They weren't expecting to see him here, and they all started expressing their thoughts out loud. The warrior skeleton was calm. He asked if the people were satisfied and repeatedly asked them to leave the dungeon. He's been very busy. The brunette thought it wasn't exactly an ordinary skeleton. The soldier became hysterical. He couldn't believe the skeleton standing in front of him, especially that he's something special. The soldier was warming up, determined to tackle the Hyla skeleton straining his armor in one blow. The warrior skeleton stood and did not move. He watched as he was threatened by a squishy soldier. He warned him if the soldier didn't want trouble, he'd better surrender. But the soldier was unstoppable. He wanted to show off to the ladies and started attacking, swinging his hammer. As he ran to meet the skeleton, all he could think about was what he would get after defeating the skeleton. His hammer was equipped with a chain blessed by the church to fight skeletons. The only thing the skeleton uttered with grinning teeth was that he was warning the soldier. The soldier was already within striking distance and swung his hammer hard, wanting to strike the skeleton with a single blow. But his body was dissected before he touched the skeleton. It was a strong and precise sword strike. The skeleton warrior cut off both of the soldier's hands, and blood poured out of the severed hands. The skeleton repeated once more that he had asked to leave. Lena looked admiringly at what the skeleton had just done. She liked his quickness and accuracy. The warrior skeleton stood looking at what he had accomplished. The soldier fell to his knees, his head on the ground. He could not keep his balance because of his severed hands. The girls stood unmoving. The soldier was losing more and more blood. His face turned pale. He trembled with loss of strength and wept with hopelessness. The skeleton leaned over him, stained with his blood. The brunette looked at the skeleton and shuddered. She was terrified that the skeleton had cut off his companion's hands. Pulling herself together, she ran to the exit of the dungeon and called out for help. Skeleton noticed her running away and couldn't understand why they didn't leave when he asked. The blonde gripped her dagger tighter. The dagger was thrown at the brunette. He stabbed her back and she started to fall. The skeleton turned around and looked at Lena. He didn't understand why the hell she threw the dagger so crookedly and didn't hit him. The skeleton warrior got into a fighting stance. Lena shouldn't have waved the dagger. It's her fault she missed. The girl and the skeleton stood opposite each other as opponents. One extra step could take one of their lives. But then Lena suddenly fell to her knees with her hands in the air. She begged the skeleton warrior for mercy. The skeleton was at a loss for words. It's too sudden a turn of events. The girl stood up and introduced herself. She was a member of the TNT community. This community was engaged in hired assassinations, theft, gathering and selling information. She could be useful to him. Skeleton, still dumbfounded by the girl's murder, decided to clarify whether Lena killed her companion on purpose. The brunette was dead. There was a sword sticking out of her back. If she managed to escape, she would bring a lot of inconvenience to the skeleton. And Lena, by her deed, rid the skeleton of them. But the skeleton didn't plan to kill anyone else. Lena could be aiming for his back too, and he can't take it so easy and trust her. Lena calmly replied that, looking at the warrior, she realized he could not be defeated so easily. And this girl wasn't her friend. She didn't feel sorry for her. Lena continued to kneel in front of the skeleton. She was telling him that she planned to kill her companions anyway. That's what she came to the dungeon for. The skeleton turned toward the girl's corpse. He repeated Lena's words about the thieves' guild, and it seemed to make sense to him. The warrior skeleton decided that their conversation was over. He turned around and headed deeper into the dungeon, letting Lena take what she needed and get out of here. 
but the girl didn't plan to back down so quickly and offered to be of service to him. But the skeleton didn't need her help. If she doesn't want to die, she needs to get out of this cave fast. But then he remembered. She sells information, and he could really use the information right now. Lena glowed with happiness. She was able to interest this warrior. She can offer him information. The warrior skeleton asked her about the Necron Society. That was what interested him most right now. The girl pondered. There was information about the Necron Society, but it was very hard to get it. The skeleton demanded rather to give him everything she knew. But Lena had a condition. Skeleton was shocked that she was putting conditions on it. He put his sword to her throat. How could she demand conditions after he kept her alive? Lena was a little scared. The girl warned that the information she has is not available to ordinary people. Once he kills it, he can only get it from the Thieves' Guild. She talked about how he should consider the fact that he was a skeleton, and it would be very difficult to do. The skeleton was silent. He thought about the girl's words. She was brash and overconfident. The warrior skeleton put his sword in its scabbard and decided to agree to the condition. Lena asked to be her ally. As soon as the warrior questioned the alliance, a blue screen appeared in front of him. A new assignment called Lena's Story popped up on the screen. He needed to become a helper from the shadows and help the girl become the head of the Thieves' Guild. The higher it goes, the more information the skeleton will have. There was also a warning there that Lena could set him up when it suited her. It was the same mission as with Rubia, then the same window appeared. He continued to stare thoughtfully at the screen. There was definitely still a lot he didn't understand, but he needed the information. Seeing that the skeleton warrior was not paying attention to her for a long time, Lena called out to him. Lena wanted to sway the skeleton to her side. The girl folded her hands beseechingly around her face. She could help him not only with information, but also with training. But before Lena could speak, the skeleton grabbed her by the throat. The warrior skeleton lifted the girl off the ground. He talked about how she didn't hesitate to kill someone like herself. Lena tried to hold on so she wouldn't suffocate from the skeleton's strong grip. Skeleton doesn't want to be betrayed. How can he trust her and become her ally? The girl smiled with the last of her strength. She asked about how he could compare her to people. She's more like him, of a lone skeleton than people. The skeleton forcefully threw her to the ground. Dust rose from the fall. Lena began to cough from the sudden intake of oxygen into her throat and the skeleton stood there asking what she wanted to say with those words. People didn't think of Lena as their own person. They were always only interested in her looks and body. You can't call such people comrades. A skeleton is only seen as a monster. He must be familiar with her feelings. The skeleton looked down. So these two lonely souls are in the same boat. Lena recovered a little from the suffocation and began to talk about the Necron Society. It was an underground organization that engaged in slave trade, contract killings, drug production, and sales. Everything they're paid for. This organization is supported by high-ranking officials and lords of the empire. Despite all this, no one knows the location of the headquarters or who is the head of this organization. That's all the information Lena had. Only the higher ranks of the Thieves' Guild know more. So Lena had an alliance proposal. A warrior. A skeleton will hunt humans as well as they hunt those considered monsters. The girl will bring her victims to this dungeon. The skeleton will raise her experience. In the meantime, she will be raising her rank in the guild. That way she can give him the information he needs. The skeleton looked at the girl. It has to be a mutually beneficial deal. The warrior skeleton thought about everything Lena had said. Her words sounded beautiful. He didn't care. He was fine with it, but he still had a question. Was it really so easy for her to take a man's life? The girl hid her eyes behind her hair and said no. Lena looked up. There was a wide smile on his face. She hates people. The skeleton, after thinking over everything that was said, agreed to the condition and became her ally. A red notice appeared. Three intruders were discovered in the dungeon. The skeleton in full combat readiness struck the first one with a single blow, and he flew off into the depths of the dungeon. The skeleton's armor and sword were stained in blood, but that didn't stop him at all. He was ready to fight to the last man. One of the intruders had loaded his bow and was aiming directly at the skeleton, but he was immediately met with instant punishment. He didn't sing a shot. A dagger flew into his back that Lena had thrown protecting her skeleton partner. She was calm and very markable. She was proud to be able to help someone she had chosen as an ally. 
Suddenly, a third intruder crept up from behind and with a sharp push in the back, knocked the girl to the ground. The man stepped a muddy boot on the girl's throat. She had lured them into a trap and he was going to put a sword through her head. He raised his sword above his head, threatening to kill her. He was angry that he'd fallen for her bait. But no sooner had he finished speaking and lowered his sword than he died. The girl only had time to see the man lying there with a sharp blade sticking out of him. It's the warrior. The skeleton protected her. He managed to kill the intruder before he could maim his companion. Lena sat on the ground and looked at her savior with great gratitude. The notification reappeared on the blue screen. The skeleton's fusion with the dungeon was increased and reached almost 20%. Swordsmanship has been upgraded to level four. The skeleton took off his helmet to read. He's been doing the same thing for months now, and his levels have started to build up more slowly. He decided to leave the place. From behind him, Lena called out to him. She was joyful and wanted to share something with him. In front of him lay the loot from the past week. Potions, gold, sword, and books. It was more than usual. The girl was proud of herself. It was all thanks to her ability to deceive people. The skeleton looked at her and thought about how happy she was about people dying. Seeing the skeleton's gaze on her, Lena's face became disgruntled. She asked him not to mention that she was killing her own kind. She decided to turn away from the insistent stare and began to explain herself. All the people she killed were scumbags, and she got pennies for their heads. Lena was angry at all these people. They bought guards, robbed, raped, and murdered. They deserve it. While the girl showed her anger, the skeleton bent over the loot. He was interested in books. The book was called The Unsightly Wizard. Those scumbags they killed were transporting books. They don't usually do that, though. The skeleton sat down and began to read. The book talked about magicians and what bad creatures they are. The warrior was interested in the text. Upon reaching the end, the skeleton realized that the author of the book held a huge grudge against the mages. The author of this book was Kevin Ashton. After the skeleton closed, the book, a blue screen appeared. It had a notice on it that his wisdom had increased by one level. The skeleton immediately rushed to the rest of the books, thus causing Lena to worry. She was surprised at this eagerness to read books. The skeleton sat leaning against the stones of the cave, having finished reading. There were a lot of books around him that had already been read. He read a lot of books, but only two of them raised his level of wisdom. They were both written by Kevin Ashton and both increased his knowledge. Lena quietly watched the skeleton with curiosity. While the skeleton was thinking about how difficult it was to increase the wisdom level, Lena approached him already from the other side. She crouched down next to the skeleton so close that she was fully touching it. If the skeleton had skin, she would sweat from the awkwardness of the situation. The skeleton turned his head away slightly. Lena was too close to him, but that didn't embarrass the girl in the least. She loved being so close to him. The girl suggested going to the village. If he liked reading so much, she could get him more books. The skeleton looked at her. She was, as always, guessing what he needed. But now there was something more important. He needed to find the nearest dungeon. Hearing that, Lena started thinking about those. Lena knew three dungeons within a week's journey from here. Arid Catacombs, Level E slash Remnant of the Spider's Nest, Level D, Lands of Mad Mist, Level C. The warrior. The skeleton questioned if they were exactly a week's journey away on foot. Lena stretched tiredly and confirmed. The skeleton pondered. It's a level F dungeon, so a level E dungeon would be a great target for him. Having made his decision, he wanted to ask Lena for something the next time she headed for the village. But she was already sweetly asleep, resting her head on the skeleton's knee. She slept so soundly. She must be very tired from running between the village and the dungeon. She hadn't rested at all all this time. The skeleton decided to get up and go back to practicing with his sword while the girl rested. But his head was sharply pierced as if by an electric shock. Looks like he's a little tired himself. A blue screen appeared. The skeleton spent 182 nights in the cave. The merge with the dungeon is more than 20%. Dungeon tries for a takedown. The letters began to swim before the warrior's eyes. The skeleton blinked, trying to see if he had fallen asleep but he can't sleep. Each time he opened his eyes, he saw Lady Succubus in front of him more and more clearly. She asked if he'd had a good dream. The skeleton finally opened his eyes. He was in the dungeon and lay in the lap of Lady Succubus. She hugged him gently. The skeleton jumped up sharply. He couldn't believe that this was really his beloved Lady Succubus.
The girl didn't see anything unusual about it. The skeleton warrior's knees trembled. Mrs. Succubus was alive. How is that possible? The succubus grinned. I guess she shouldn't have woken him up. He was too scared. The skeleton was so happy to see his mistress that he acted like a little child. That's when he noticed he was standing naked. He wasn't wearing his armor. Mrs. Succubus walked over to the skeleton and hugged it, she reassured him. To her, it seemed he was too scared. She thought the skeleton was having a good dream, but apparently the dream was a nightmare. Those words made the skeleton a little wary. Mrs. Succubus asked softly and quietly what story the warrior skeleton wanted to hear today. The girl took his bones in her hand. It was a great relief to feel her warmth on my limbs and led him deep into the dungeon. The skeleton was glad to be living here again with his beloved mistress and followed her obediently. The skeleton's feet were shod in boots and walked very slowly. He was fully uniformed and walking alone into the darkness. Lena slowly awoke from a sound sleep. She crouched down on the cold ground, rubbing her eyes and calling out to the skeleton warrior. But in the vast dark cavern, she was alone. There was no skeleton within sight. She began to look around looking for him with her eyes. She couldn't figure out where he'd gone. Meanwhile, the warm hand of Lady Succubus was resting on the skeleton's head. His head rested on her soft lap. Mrs. Succubus was stroking the skull with one hand and holding a book in her other hand. She read it to her devoted friend. Her fingers covered his eye. He hardly listened to the mistress's words. He tried to believe that everything that had happened before was just a dream. He looked at his bony fingers and thought about how real it was. The skeleton turned its head and looked at the mistress. As long as she's around, none of this matters. Mrs. Succubus looked questioningly at the skeleton. She was alive and unharmed. She slammed the book shut. Apparently this story was too boring and uninteresting. Skeleton didn't mean to offend her. He assured her that he enjoyed the story, as long as she doesn't leave. Then Mrs. Succubus suggested that we continue talking about the skeleton's dream. Her gaze became sly. She reminded him that he'd stopped at the moment where he'd met Lena. She wondered what she was like. At that time, Lena came out of the cave. It was daytime outside and the sun was hot. The girl stretched with pleasure. She began to knead her body. It was stiff from sleeping for so long in an uncomfortable position and on the hard ground. Finishing her warm-up, she began to look around for the skeleton. He wasn't here, so she decided to check further. But then she heard strange noises that made her look around and listen. Somewhere not far away were soldiers. There were many of them, and they were going to make a sweep of the dungeon. Their commander gave instructions and talked about the mission. The dungeon was called the Ghost Crypt. It was used as a military training ground for soldiers, but a lot of people have been going missing lately, and supposedly they were seen here. This dungeon needs to be cleared, especially since it was in the Blue Lion's domain. Lena was terrified. This case smells like a sting. Skeleton, sitting next to Mrs. Succubus, told her what he saw Lena as for him. Mistress found out everything she wanted to know. She seemed very cheerful to her. She offered them an alliance in such a difficult situation. But this cheerfulness only annoyed the skeleton. He thought, but he was also sad at the same time. Mrs. Succubus asked a question. Is the skeleton going to leave her for dead too, just like her? The skeleton trembled. What did she mean by that? A red warning appeared. One trespasser was located. But how could there be an intruder here? The skeleton remembered the moments of his mistress's death, her dying face, and the man who killed her, how he laughed after what he had done. He remembered her death as clearly as if it had just happened. Those bastards wouldn't dare touch his lady succubus again. Taking his sword in hand, the skeleton intended to protect her this time. She doesn't have to die this time. But that's when Lena found him. He sat on a rock at the back of the cave, talking to himself. She, sliding on the rocks, came down to him. Now was not the time to rest. The skeleton saw her. The skeleton's eyes burned with blue fire, like the previous dungeon boss. The girl couldn't see his eyes. Lena didn't notice the change in him and kept calling out. The skeleton stood up. His actions were slowed down. Rising up, the skeleton spoke of having to protect her. Those words alerted Lena. Lena took a step back in fright. She saw the skeleton's strange behavior and became frightened. Thoth gripped his sword tightly, like he was about to strike now. And he did. His opponent turned out to be a girl with whom the skeleton had recently formed an alliance. He stood across from her and threatened her with his sword. She tried to calm him down, completely unarmed. 
She didn't understand why he was attacking her. She wondered aloud what she could have insulted him with, but she thought about the fact that the warrior skeleton had become something, obsessed. An arrow flew at them with a whistling sound. She fell right at the feet of the stunned girl. Just a little more and it would have hit her. There were soldiers standing on the rocks above. They were talking and getting ready for another shot. But the skeleton didn't notice them. It was a reconnaissance team that had already reported that they had found a witch and a monster. But the warrior skeleton was now out of sorts. He didn't care about the soldiers he didn't see. And Lena had to come up with a plan right away. A bunch of sharp arrows flew at the girl, which she swatted away with her bare hands. Covering her face, she called out to the skeleton warrior, trying to bring him to his senses with her scream. But he didn't hear her. His eyes burned blue fire ever brighter, and he did not regain consciousness. Behind him stood Mistress Succubus, she asked about his next actions. The skeleton was preparing for an invasion by a group of soldiers. The skeleton standing before the mistress will not allow them to bring harm to his beloved Lady Succubus again. But then Rubia showed up. This innocent creature asked why the skeleton left her for dead. The skeleton fell to the ground from such an unexpected appearance. The living Rubia stood before him. She talked about how the skeleton promised to protect her. She looked sternly at the skeleton who had failed to fulfill her promise. Lady Succubus placed a hand on her loyal warrior's shoulder. Didn't he know why he couldn't protect them? The woman leaned closer to his skull and whispered, This all happened because he's weak. The warrior skeleton sat on the ground between two women who had died, between those he failed to protect. They were both angry and yelling at him. They cried out that they had trusted some weak skeleton for nothing. Their deaths were his fault. He promised to protect them, but he didn't keep his promise. The skeleton was falling into a maelstrom of horrible thoughts. He was accepting his weakness and infirmity. In the forest, one of the soldiers came running to his master who was sitting on a horse. He informed him that the scouts had located their targets. On his horse sat a handsome and young knight. He was pleased to hear that the targets had been found. The skeleton was in the middle of a huge amount of water. He was drowning in the ocean. Making no attempt to swim, he stretched his arms helplessly toward the light. He wanted to get stronger. While the skeleton was unconscious in the dungeon, the soldiers were preparing for another attack. The archers awaited the command. Having managed to take cover behind a rock that a bunch of arrows were trying to pierce, Lena pondered her next actions. Looking at the skeleton, which was getting worse, she thought about how long it would be until he came to his senses. There was no choice but to take the rope. We can't stand still. The soldiers will get to them sooner or later. The soldiers had already fled. They wanted to catch and capture her. There's not much left to do, and they will fulfill their mission. But a lighted bomb that abruptly appeared in front of the soldiers' feet made them freeze in place. Sweating with fear, they commanded a sharp retreat. The bomb blast increased the distance between the fleeing Lena with the skeleton on her back from the soldiers who were chasing them. The girl seemed to be flying rather than running, and the skeleton behind her back had completely weakened. He dangled the wandless toy behind Lena's back and moaned. His eyes were fading. The girl was satisfied that the plan had succeeded. All that was left was to drive all the soldiers deeper into the dungeon and poison them with a gas bomb. Her arm was grazed by an arrow. In pain, the girl stopped and let go of the rope that held the skeleton. The skeleton slumped over and sat on the ground. A soldier stood in front of Lena. He'd had enough of her cheap tricks. He was serious about detaining her on suspicion of mass murdering people. He called her a witch. Lena was silent, rubbing her injured shoulder. The skeleton behind her rose with a loud groan. The girl called out to him worriedly, and the soldiers were a bit taken aback by this behavior. The elderly soldier was now convinced that the rumors that the witch possessed necromancy were true. He ordered the archer to get rid of the skeleton first, the one prepared to shoot. Hearing the senior soldier's order, the girl quickly began to think about her next move. The skeleton stood still and didn't move, and Lena quickly ran to cover him. The skeleton's eyes went blank. He was deep underwater and trying to remember who he was and how he got here. He looked at his bones and thought about what his afterlife was like. That was why he was able to meet both Succubus Mistress and Rubia here. It was as if he was weightless, surrounded by a dense liquid. He was glad to see these women one last time. The skeleton wanted to close his eyes and go to sleep, dissolve in that serenity. But adrift, he was overcome with doubts. Are you sure he's dead? No, he's not dead. If he were dead, he'd be resurrected immediately. 
It's an illusion. He needs to wake up. The skeleton clenched his hands into fists. He needs to get stronger, to be able to protect his mistress 20 years from now. He is a warrior, a skeleton protecting his mistress. No one can crush him. He will save them all. There were trickles of blood running down the skeleton's skull. He opened his eyes and saw Lena. The girl stood over him covered in blood. She looked at him fondly. Smiling with the last of her strength, Lena asked if he'd gotten a good night's sleep. More blood flowed from her mouth. She knelt in front of him and protected him as much as she could. There were arrows sticking out of her back that had caused her serious wounds. The warrior skeleton took her in his arms. He was angry that he had slept for so long, and Lena is now bleeding on his bones. The girl was glad her skeleton friend was awake. She asked me to thank her after they got out of here. A senior soldier yelled at his subordinates. They shot the girl they were supposed to take alive. The order was to kill the skeleton. Something made the older soldier look forward. The warrior skeleton rose from the ground and held the dying girl in his arms. The soldier decided to ask one last time if this witch would go with them. But Lena only smiled slyly. Can't this old man feel anything? The elderly soldier felt and sweated with fear. A long wick was burning under the man's feet. He looked at him, then back at his enemies. It smelled like a sting. All the soldiers began to follow the movement of the burning wick. And they saw behind rocks in a small ravine a huge ammunition depot about to explode. It was Lena's parting gift. She was pleased with herself. The warehouse exploded with blue-purple fire, and all the soldiers scattered in different directions. They wanted to save themselves. It was poison gas. The soldiers began to go blind and suffocate. Every one of them wanted to get out. Some were already crawling. Some were dropping dead immediately. Satisfied with herself, Lena asked the skeleton warrior to carry her. She'd managed to get him this far, and she could use a rest now. The skeleton was surprised. He hadn't expected her to protect him at the cost of her own life. The elderly soldier was smart. He covered his eyes and mouth with his hands and didn't pass out from the choking gas. He ordered the remaining soldiers to apprehend the fleeing criminals. The skeleton warrior threw Lena on his back and ran with her down the tunnel. Behind him, soldiers with swords in their hands ran after him. With one hand, the skeleton held the fainting girl. With the other hand, he fended off the attacks of the overtaking soldiers. He ran like lightning, and Lena pressed herself harder against him. There were still arrows sticking out of her back, preventing the blood from flowing faster. Now the skeleton was concerned with the question of why she didn't run away. There were so many soldiers that she should have run away. But the girl thought otherwise. She was his ally, and allies don't abandon their own in trouble. The warrior soldier regretted falling into the illusion and staying there for so long. Lena's words caught him. They ran out of the dungeon into the clearing. Poisonous purple smoke was coming out of the cave entrance. The skeleton quickly looked around. He held the weakened girl behind his back, and there was no need for the soldiers to be close. Gently placing the girl on her stomach, the skeleton wanted to quietly chip the arrow so as not to hurt Lena. A large shadow was looming behind him. Someone was approaching. The approaching man spoke to Lena. He talked about the rumors that had been going around. She was considered an excellent necromancer. The skeleton turned his head at the voice. The skeleton warrior had no time to do anything and was struck with a sharp sword strike. In front of him was a soldier in shining armor. It was the head knight, the man shone in the sunlight that reflected in the metal he wore. The skeleton warrior's arm flew. She was cut off by the head knight. The skeleton fell over in pain and surprise. The defeated warrior skeleton fell to the ground at the knight's feet. The one stood glowing in the light of his victory. There was not an ounce of doubt on his face as to the rightness of his action. The knight called out to his servant. A small, plump old man came out of the bushes. He was clearly not dressed for battle, and at the mention of his name he was pounding with fear. The knight stood looking at the skeleton and the girl he had defeated and asked his servant who they were. The formidable man stepped a metal boot on the dying girl's shoulder. Her face creased in pain. The knight considered them lowlifes, and was angry about wasting his precious time on them. The warrior skeleton watched his companion being humiliated. The knight stood on the girl's arm and did not think of removing his foot. The servant folded his hands in supplication. He believed that the dying girl was a skilled necromancer. But his words did not convince the knight, and he thrust himself with all his anger at the frightened old man. His majesty was as beautiful as it was frightening. Even a fleeting glance from him could give an old man a heart attack. 
The old servant was afraid of his master's anger and drew his dagger. Taking it out of its sheath, he spoke of paying for his transgressions with his life. The man put the dagger to his throat, ready to pierce himself, but he heard him being stopped. The knight folded his arms across his chest and closed his eyes. He was displeased with this behavior of the servant. He didn't order him to end his life. The old man dropped his dagger and fell to his knees in front of the Lord. The nobles don't care at all if an informant is killed for an erroneous report. An elderly servant, kneeling on his knees, tried to catch his breath. He survived. His master, on the other hand, turned around and decided to leave on his many errands. He didn't care at all what condition the old man was in now. At last the knight ordered after the trial to do with the girl as he saw fit. Behind the formidable man stood a warrior, a skeleton. The knight heard his movements and turned around sharply. The warrior skeleton stood before his companion. Despite the severed limb, he held the sword firmly in his other hand. He was ready to protect the girl that was bleeding behind him. The skeleton didn't realize who the man in front of him was. He severed the arm so quickly that the warrior didn't even notice the movement of the sword. This knight was unlike the people the skeleton had met before. He had abilities on a whole other level. The knight turned to the reluctant skeleton, and though the skeleton stood before him ready to attack, he doubted if he could defeat him. Behind the skeleton lay a girl. She began to cough in pain from her bleeding wounds. Hearing the sounds of suffering, the skeleton stopped and wondered if he was doing the right thing. But none of that mattered anymore. He gripped his sword tighter in his hand. The skeleton warrior didn't care who his opponent was, and he threw himself into the attack. The knight dodged his opponent's swift kick in a flash. The skeleton and the knight studied each other carefully. Neither of them knew the abilities of their opponent. The servant, coming to his senses, began to scream at the skeleton's audacity. How could a skeleton afford to attack a knight? At this moment, the soldiers that survived the suffocating gas explosion, coughing, began to come out of the dungeon. An angry elderly servant started yelling at the soldiers. He called them slow bums and ordered them to help the Lord kill the skeleton. But the soldiers had not yet come to their senses. There was a fog in front of their eyes, and they could barely stay on their feet. The skeleton warrior's movement slowed. It became hard for him to hold the sword, and he lowered his hand. The world floated in front of the skeleton. He got a feeling of dizziness. He asked himself what was going on around him. A red screen with a warning appeared. The skill suppression was used. The skeleton warrior's level was lower than the opponent's, and his mobility would be limited. This skill caused the skeleton to fall to its knees and bow its head. A knight approached the fallen skeleton. It was interesting for him to observe his behavior. The elderly servant also fell from this skill. He was unconscious. The knight walked past the defeated skeleton. It was incomprehensible to him why, while the one who had summoned the unclean thing here was unconscious, the skeleton was still in motion. He walked over to the girl whose back was covered in arrows. The knight didn't see this girl as a skilled necromancer. And he decided to kill this girl right now. The knight began to pull his huge, shiny sword from its sheath. The skeleton saw and heard everything despite his depressed state. He felt dizzy. His eyes saw everything blurry, and his arms and legs didn't want to obey at all. But he was getting up. The sword held by the knight who was now about to kill the girl as if ordering the skeleton to stand up. The sword glittered brighter than the sun and was sharper than any knife killing faster than any poison. But the warrior, skeleton was fast and a strong blow in the back did not allow the knight to make a crushing blow. Having struck a blow, the skeleton warrior gathered his strength so as not to fall down and give up. But from that blow, the skeleton's sword broke. It was a huge loss in this battle. The knight was surprised at such resilience and bravery that the skeleton had just, just now, shown. Despite the broken sword, he wasn't going to give up. Looks like the informant's report wasn't so wrong. The knight lowered his sword right in front of the head of the skeleton who was holding on from his last strength. The warrior skeleton lifted his head up and looked at his opponent. I guess that was the end of it. The knight in blinding armor raised his sword to deliver the final blow. The skeleton warrior was no longer resisting and was carried several meters away from the impact. Red notifications appeared. The level of his opponent is impossible to measure. All attacks will bring no result. The difference in levels is too high. The defense is not going to succeed. Looks like he's dead. Darkness has fallen, but it will go back to the very beginning. The skeleton warrior woke up, but he was not in the grave from which he had risen several times. 
He started looking around, trying to figure out what this place he woke up in was. Where's Rubia? Where's the cemetery? Asked the skeleton to himself. The skeleton felt warmth and movement in his legs and looked down. Lena was sleeping sweetly on his lap. After looking at the sleeping girl, the skeleton began to come to his senses, and a blue notification screen appeared in front of him. He looked at the screen. It said that all memory had been saved, and he was Pelanese to the checkpoint. He was a level one skeleton with no name, but all the indicators have been maintained. Because of the return to life, the fusion with the dungeon had been reduced to 92%. The skeleton looked at the screen and wondered aloud about where he was. A torch was burning on one of the walls of the dungeon, allowing you to see everything around you. On the cold ground, Lena slept. Instead of a pillow, there were folded things under her head. And the skeleton warrior sat further away from her and pondered. He was reborn again, but he was not reborn in the grave, nor was Rubia beside him. There were no forests and no thunder and rain. From the sharp stones on the ceiling of the dungeon, water flowed calmly. Underfoot was not mud and puddles, but the dry earth of the dungeon. No Rubia who raised her hands to meet him, no one who raised him. The skeleton covered his face with his huge gloves, remembering the careless necromancer. He wanted to cry, but no tears flowed from his empty eye sockets. Rubia was dead. He saw her cold, exhausted body in the woods. He clutched his head with his hands and the blue screen reappeared in front of his eyes. It was a memorial. The skeleton had died five times already and had reached the necromancer's maximum sympathy in his previous life. A bonus appeared. He could go from level for the necromancer's sake to level the necromancer's lover. Going to the necromancer's lover level surprised the skeleton. All the bonuses this level gave were not particularly useful for battle, but added sympathy with necromancers in the future. But was he really given this level of necromancer sympathy because of Lena? Had she been mistaken for a necromancer? But then in the battle, that girl said she would protect the skeleton, and she did it at the cost of her life. The skeleton warrior decided he should thank his companion. Lena was already waking up. Opening her eyes, she saw the skeleton standing in front of her. The one called out to her determined to get out of here. The warrior skeleton saw that the girl was awake and went to get ready, putting on his helmet. He warned her that they were leaving and to take the essentials with them. The girl who hadn't had time to wake up didn't understand why now. After all, it's nighttime outside, but the skeleton was solid. They're leaving now. They ran out of the dungeon. The skeleton remembered that before he lost his mind, they had been attacked in this cave and there was little time left before the attack. He was mindful of the dungeon trying to swallow him up. He spent 182 days in it. They need to run. If they don't get out of here in time, the order will arrive at dawn, and he will again be unable to protect his companion. An unsuspecting Lena ran after the skeleton. Looking at the moon in the high sky, skeleton clarified which dungeon they were going to. The next one, he thought, was the arid catacombs. But Lena decides to go to the remains of the spider's nest. It seems like a good idea to her. Lena had heard recently that the arid catacombs had recently emptied out. The skeleton didn't understand how the dungeon could be empty. The girl explained to him that all the monsters were now just dissolving into thin air. Apparently, a group of soldiers have accomplished their mission to find and destroy. Apparently, it's been cleaned up recently and they won't find anything there. Hearing about the soldiers, the skeleton paused briefly. Does Lena know something about the soldiers? He turned around to ask her. The warrior skeleton decided to ask Lena if she knew anything about knights in blue armor with lion engraving. The girl pondered. Apparently the skeleton was talking about the blue lion templars. It's one of the orders of the empire's servants. Skeleton wanted to know more details about the knights of the blue order. It was important for him to find out how strong they were, but Lena had never seen them live. It is the strongest order of knights, their leader is one of the top four swordsmen. His mastery of the sword is unrivaled in the empire. So that knight carrying the seraphim sword was the best swordsman and chief knight of the order. The skeleton stood unmoving from accepting this information. It was the Marquis Bartin von Leonardo. He was the one they met on the way out of the cave, and he was the reason the skeleton died. Skeleton and Lena continued on their way. The skeleton was immersed in his thoughts. He thought about why such a talented swordsman was in the southern suburbs. Each step, a new thought of the night. He was alone, without his order, so far away. 
That's when the skeleton called out to Lena. The girl said that they needed to stop in a town nearby if they wanted to continue to the remains of the spider's nest dungeon. Skeleton didn't understand what they were doing it for. Lena said it was necessary to procure antidotes in case they were bitten by poisonous spiders. You need to buy gas bombs to tear up the cobwebs in your path. But there was something else Lena craved. The girl bowed her head and mouthed that she really wanted to take a bath. The skeleton didn't know what to say to that. He thought only of himself the whole way, and completely oblivious to the girl's needs. He accepted the fact that a bath was a necessity for her. It was already dawning when the travelers emerged from the forest and approached the town. The skeleton stopped and looked at the town they were approaching. Lena was very excited. This is the largest city on their route, and the grocery store must be huge. That town was the ill-fated Yublam. At the sight of these walls, the skeleton immediately remembered the one he had lost, Rubia. He remembered how he came to be here, a naked skeleton with a bag of stuff on his shoulders, and now a warrior in armor stood before this city. The girl noticed that something was going on with the skeleton. She cautiously approached him and offered to go alone if he was suddenly uncomfortable being among people. But the skeleton warrior heard this firmly and loudly said no, Lena was slightly frightened by this behavior. The skeleton stood his ground. He won't let Lena walk alone. The warrior said he was going with a girl. She sighed in surprise, but I was glad she did. The girl realized he was coming with her and decided to do something before going into town. The skeleton raised his hands in surprise at her touch. The girl put a cloak on the warrior skeleton. Now he was even more like a warrior knight. The skeleton stood in front of Lena wearing a cloak that fluttered in the wind and asked what she had put the cloak on him for. The smiling girl said it wasn't for anything. It was just for fun. She bought it for the warrior to see how he would look in it. A caretaker came out from behind the gate. He shouted that before they could enter the city, they had to pay. The caretaker squinted his eyes. He watched carefully. They didn't look like local people. Looking at the girl's bulging breasts, he wondered if she was single. Lena scooped the skeleton up under her arm. She introduced him as her husband. He was a fine traveling knight. The caretaker, hearing about the husband, immediately lost interest in the girl. He ordered the guards to open the gate and invited the travelers to enter. The skeleton turned on the girl. He interjected who she called her husband. Lena did not stop hugging and gazing lovingly at the warrior said that no one cared that he was her husband. There's no need to be embarrassed about it. Upon entering the city, the skeleton and the girl began to catch oblique glances from passers-by. There was a strong odor of opium in the city. The odor was so strong that you could smell it on the streets where there were no brothels. Yeah, and this town doesn't seem to like travelers. The girl covered her mouth with her hand and pulled the skeleton warrior to the side. They needed to find a room immediately, so they headed towards the inn. Moving away from the townspeople, the skeleton warrior asked for his arm to be released. But the girl said they are a married couple and they need to behave accordingly. While the skeleton and the girl were fooling around looking for an inn, a man watched them from around the corner, covered in darkness. Walking into the inn, the girl said hello loudly. Standing behind the bar was a cute girl in a green dress. She asked the travelers what they wanted, to stay overnight or just to eat. While Lena ordered food for the room, the skeleton looked at the girl behind the bar. She was now the new owner of the inn, following the man's death. The skeleton stared so intently at its owner that she noticed his gaze on herself. The warrior looked at his neck, trying to find the mark of the snake on it like on the past owner. The innkeeper leaned dreamily on the bar, looking at the interested warrior. She thought he desired more than food and room. Lena turned menacingly on her companion. The skeleton warrior immediately realized from the expression on the girl's face that something wrong had happened. In the morning, the girl's enthusiastic words were heard from the traveler's room. She got a great night's sleep. After a bath and a good night's sleep, she feels completely rested. The skeleton was pleased to hear that her fatigue was completely gone. Joyfully stepping ahead of the skeleton, the girl headed for the grocery store. Skeleton had been on guard all night, but no one had tried to break in. He tried very hard to make sure the girl wasn't alone. Who would ever leave her alone? The skeleton turned in the opposite direction. He sensed something was wrong here. Lena stopped and looked at her companion in surprise. The skeleton warrior checked all the corners and back alleys for danger, but without noticing anything, he continued on his way. 
In the grocery store, among the vials and jars, the girl's disgruntled words were heard. The salesman, arranging the goods on the shelves, repeated that all the antidotes and incendiary bombs were sold out. The girl couldn't believe it. Then Lena decided to buy ten bottles and a barrel of resin. The salesman stood in front of her and talked about how that was all over, too. The skeleton was standing in the shade under a tree when shouts came from the store. The girl was yelling about how the salesperson didn't want to sell her anything because she wasn't from around here. Is there really nothing in this store at all? The salesman also raised his voice at the girl. It's all sold out, and there's nothing he can do about it. The skeleton realized this was bad and bowed his head thoughtfully. Glaring squeamishly at the customer, the salesman waved his hand, asking her to get out of the store. He wasn't happy with her, and he wasn't going to sell her anything. Lena was ready to lash out at the noxious man. She was seething with anger, but a skeleton put a hand on her shoulder wanting to reassure her. He asked her to ignore the man. It was time for them to get out of here. Sklet took the girl's hand and led the way. Lena resisted. It seemed to her that the warrior should teach this insolent man a lesson. In the shadows again stood the man watching them. The skeleton increased its stride speed, so the girl had to run. The seller was in no mood to trade with them. He hid all the goods and lied that they were gone. The man from the shadows followed the travelers. The man was wearing dark clothes and his face was concealed by a hood. He looked out from around the corner to see where the people he was following were headed. But then the point of the sword was at the man's throat. He stopped, afraid to move, he was caught. In front of him was a warrior, a skeleton and a blonde-haired girl. They were clearly not in a friendly mood. The skeleton looked at the man. His face seemed very familiar to him. This man was at the entrance to the city. A blacksmith who greeted them with a slanted glance like the rest of the inhabitants of the city of Yublam. The skeleton looking at the blacksmith asked why he was following them. The man just turned around and walked away without explaining anything. He asked the travelers to follow him. Dumbfounded by such a command, the skeleton and Lena followed the man. The man said the travelers would be in danger if they lingered here. The skeleton didn't understand how this alleyway could be dangerous. But the man turned around and said with a serious face that it was the whole town that was dangerous here. In the house they came to, there was a lot of military equipment, axes, shields, and household utensils. While the blacksmith poured the drink, the skeleton stood with his arms folded across his chest, wondering why this man was following them. Lena looked around curiously. The man inquired if they were going to the remains of the spider's nest. Lena was very surprised to hear that he knew where they were going. But the blacksmith, sipping from a wooden mug, said that antidotes and explosive bombs were only needed by those heading into this cave. But Lena can't buy anything here. Even if the merchants have it all, they won't sell them anything. The skeleton asked why. Banging his mug loudly on the table, the blacksmith said that the city guards and the lord were raising spiders. But how could the guards raise spiders? Questioned the anxious girl. The man's all downcast. He didn't understand why they were doing it either. The man was sitting in a chair. He looked completely lost. He spelled out that the city was dying. After the old lord died under mysterious circumstances, the new lord has replaced all the guards with animals. After that, the townspeople became addicted to opium. They sold everything to buy their dope. And the new lord was only too happy to do so. He was making money for himself. Those who disobeyed or asked unnecessary questions were sent to the spider cave. After these words, the blacksmith covered his face with his hands so that his guests would not see the tears. The same fate befell the man's wife. There was a heavy silence. Even the skeleton felt uneasy. Looking down at the blacksmith, the skeleton warrior asked why he had told them such a sad story. Smith wanted these men to avenge him. Skeleton didn't understand why they should retaliate. The man was sure that the skeleton and the girl had come to this town for revenge. He pointed his finger at the armor the skeleton warrior was wearing. This armor was made by a blacksmith. The entire garment of the skeleton warrior was made by his hands. Previously, the young mistress wanted to buy this armor for someone very dear to her. She was here and chose this particular garment. Hearing the mention of Rubia, the skeleton warrior tightly clenched his hand into a fist. Lena felt the tension the skeleton was feeling, but she didn't understand what caused it, and looked at her companion with a questioning look. This was followed by the man saying that wanderers who travel alone are targeted by the city. The skeleton couldn't stand those words and picked up the man with anger, 
clutching the collar of his clothing tightly in his fist. He didn't understand how the one who knew all this did nothing to help the poor girl. But the blacksmith was a coward. He's been afraid his whole life. Even the moment they came for Rubia, he didn't resist. The man was old, despite his rather chipper appearance. He, an old man, could do nothing in front of the two young guards to protect the fragile girl. And they led her away while he sat like a lowlife crying quietly in the corner. In a huge room under the light of a dim lamp, the skeleton stood and continued to hold the man that had failed to protect Rubia. A little farther away from them, Lena stood silent. Right now, the captain of the guard and his men are leading criminals into the spider cave. He leads them as food for spiders. The man quickly got up and started looking for his things. He was going to give them the goods to set the spiders on fire, but he asked them to burn the creeps that take people there. Lena shrieked in surprise. He stared intently at something and couldn't believe his eyes. There was something there that struck her. The blacksmith turned around to look at what the girl had found. It was a flame from across the sea that would not go out. Smith didn't expect Lena to know what it was. There was a container with a cork lid on the table and a flame burning inside. It was the Grasmere fire. The shackled men walked barefoot on the cold ground. The shouts of the guards pushing up the detained men crushed. The men walked in a long chain of two. They were threatened by the commander, apparently believing it would make them go to certain death faster. Watching all this from the tree were the skeleton and Lena. The girl's face expressed wild fury. The guards were constantly insulting and yelling at their hostages. As they approached the huge rock below which was the stone entrance to the cave, the skeleton clarified if they had correctly found the remains of the spider's nest. Lena was walking ahead. She turned around to ask the skeleton warrior if he would use the thing or trust the girl with it. The skeleton stared at the girl, trying to figure out what she was talking about. In the girl's hands was a loaded, huge flamethrower. She held it skillfully in her hands. Earlier in the blacksmith's house, she had seen the lamp and asked if it was definitely the Grasmian fire. Lena looked at this lamp with great desire and admiration. She had heard that she was hard to get even in Grasmere, the city of blacksmiths. The blacksmith covered his eyes, sadly. He was only able to make one lamp in his entire life, although the man himself was originally from the city of blacksmiths. The man sighed and approached the object. He was going to teach the girl how to use it. Lena and the skeleton froze in surprise. The warrior skeleton held this strange tool in his hands and had no idea how to use it. These strange sensations made him nervous. He peered into the muzzle of the flamethrower and asked what it was. The blacksmith, seeing the flamethrower in the guy's hands with a shout of watch out, rushed towards him. Lena smiled at the skeleton's curiosity. Rumor had it that once lit, these flamethrowers were impossible to extinguish. The skeleton questioned whether they were definitely impossible to extinguish. Unless the inside of the bottle is enchanted with ice magic, the flames can burn for decades. The flames in the bottle were beautifully shimmering and enchanting. The blacksmith retreated to his cabinets. He told me that the tool in the skeleton's hands could serve to harden, steel instead of a blast furnace. The man held out a sack to the guests. If you sprinkle yourself with the contents of the bag, you may not feel the heat of the flame. Previously, with all the items that the travelers were interested in, he wanted to create a masterpiece, but giving it all to them would be the best solution, especially if they use them to get rid of all these assholes. Upon entering the cave, the skeleton decided that the flamethrower was best kept by Lena. This weapon looked dangerous to him, and he asked to use it only as a last resort. The warrior himself drew his sword from its sheath. He bypassed the girl and entered the cave first. Lena dutifully agreed to use the flamethrower only as a last resort, and so these allies determinedly entered the cave. The remains of the spider's nest dungeon was different from the previous one. Its walls were not gray and cold. There was more earth than rocks, the ceilings were higher, and there were cobwebs hanging everywhere. Their footsteps echoed loudly off the walls. The skeleton warrior went first and clutched his sword tightly, trying to keep watch. Lena was terrified. She could feel how much this place was creepy. Trying not to get discouraged, Lena decided to make a joke. It was her first time here, and the place reminded her of the attic of an abandoned house. The skeleton warrior didn't react to her joke in any way. He listened carefully to the sounds around them. Lena, expecting some kind of reaction, looked meaningfully at her companion. 
The only thing the skeleton said was that it was very quiet, although quite recently a bunch of people have gotten in here. Further on, the path they followed divided into many paths, and the wet ground made it difficult to find footprints. The warrior skeleton turned to his companion and asked where they should head first. Lena hadn't expected to have to pick her own way. The girl had a question. She, without answering the skeleton's question, asked for an answer to her question. Lowering her gaze, the girl waited for permission from the warrior. She remembered the girl Rubia the blacksmith in Ublum had mentioned. Lena wondered who Rubia was to the skeleton. That question stumped the warrior. Skeleton didn't want to continue this conversation. He turned his back on Lena and said that girl was nothing to him. But the girl kept up. Rubia was buying armor for someone dear to her. Without turning around, the skeleton pronounced that the armor was only needed for a mutually beneficial deal between them. Lena smiled. It certainly wasn't the answer she wanted to hear, but I had to agree. Without letting him finish, the skeleton warrior interrupted Lena's words. He admitted that he had not kept his promise to protect Rubia. Finishing at that, the skeleton stopped in front of the wall. Farther on, there was a dead end and the road cut off. The topic of their conversation changed abruptly. But that wasn't enough for Lena, and she wanted to continue. The skeleton looking down the small tunnel was annoyed by her curiosity. Lena held out in her palms a gold locket on a string. Looking at it, the skeleton asked what it was. He took the gift from his companion and lifted it higher to discern. A web of spider webs was already weaving over the skeleton and Lena. The companions paid no attention to the spiders surrounding them. They were busy wondering why Lena was giving her locket to a skeleton. It seemed to the girl that she should lend this locket to him for a while. It was a very expensive thing for Lena. The skeleton didn't understand why the girl would give him such a valuable thing to her. Just then, drops of white liquid began to fall on the warrior's spanking. He touched his helmet with his hand. There was white slime left on his gloves. Examining the liquid that was on his fingers, he thought about what it was. The skeleton decided to look up from where this liquid was flowing and froze. Above his head, a huge brown spider dangled in a pile of fresh cobwebs. The one was apparently very hungry, which made its mouth run with liquid. Lena grabbed her dagger and wanted to run away, seeing the spiders that had found them earlier. But not in time, her legs were caught in the rope preventing her from moving. Lena looked down at her feet to see what was preventing her from moving. And what she saw surprised her. The web rope abruptly looped around the girl's leg several times and lifted her into the air. The skeleton had no time to catch her and screamed. The warrior skeleton put his hands up, trying to prevent his companion from being kidnapped, but it didn't work out. Toward him, sharp tentacles quickly descended from above, ready to pierce the skeleton. The skeleton barely had time to dodge the attack. The tentacles struck exactly where the skeleton had jumped from. The skeleton warrior didn't have time to think and drew his sword to attack the spiders. With sharp and precise sword movements, he left wounds on the huge spider. Green blood poured out of those wounds. But the spider didn't plan to die. Useless swings of his sword have gotten him nowhere, and the skeleton decides to get rid of the cobwebs first. As the skeleton warrior moved in the direction Lena had been dragged away, out of the corner of his eye, he noticed something that made him stop. But the skeleton had no time to react to the movement and was swept off his feet by the huge claw of the spider he was fighting. The warrior skeleton fell to the ground from an impossibly strong blow. From the pain he was in, he began to cough. The skeleton didn't have time to lie down and come to his senses, so he got up. Slowly, but he was rising from his knees. Before he could get up, a small spider jumped on him. He pinned him to the ground with his claws to keep him horizontal. The spider's eyes burned with red, fierce fire. The skeleton grabbed the spider's claws and held it so it couldn't reach its mouth to his face and bite through his helmet. In this struggle for life with the spider, the skeleton notices a girl hanging by her leg. Lena was hanging upside down and seemed to be unconscious. But Lena was conscious. She screamed in fear. Smaller spiders were coming at her in a huge mob, and the cobwebs around the girl were getting bigger and bigger. Seeing and hearing their companion the skeleton hands let go of the spider, they reached for the sword the skeleton had dropped as it fell. Spurred on by cries for help, the skeleton warrior reached for his sword and gripped it tightly. With this sword, he pierced a huge monster. With his sword, he sliced open the spider's skull, cursing it. A pool of green blood was gushing out of his skull. 
The skeleton took a moment to catch his breath after his hard fight for life. But it turned out that the toughest battle was yet to come. A black wall with a bunch of red eyes was looming over the skeleton. There were so many monsters moving so fast that it was impossible to keep track of how many and where they were. Lena was hanging from the ceiling of the dungeon on a rope of cobwebs. She was being approached by a huge number of spiders wanting to eat her. The girl made a quick motion with her hand, dropping the dagger without anyone noticing. The dagger hit the target, right into the spider's head and green blood spurted out. Under Lena's weight, the cobwebs were beginning to tear and slowly slide down her legs. A swarm of huge and hungry spiders came closer and closer to her. Looking at them, the girl realized that her affairs left much to be desired. At this time, the skeleton warrior was doing battle below. He sliced the spiders' heads open with his sword time after time. But they didn't die, and there were more and more of them. The skeleton found himself surrounded by bloodthirsty monsters. One of the spiders decided to go on the attack against the skeleton, and with quick movements, he pounced on him. But the skeleton was agile and managed to dodge. The spider's tentacles only grazed the armor on the skeleton. The skeleton had to lean back hard to keep the tentacle from hitting important parts of his body. But because of this procrastination, the spiders came closer and closer. There were too many of them. From above, another spider flew onto the skeleton. The warrior was in an awkward position to repel the attack. But the warrior skeleton had trained well over the months in the dungeon and repelled the attack at the last moment. Looking at the spider attacking the skeleton, he threatened it and contemplated a plan for further battle. The skeleton warrior managed to strike his opponent, cutting off his leg. He was sick of these huge bugs. The spider let out a horrible cry of pain. Enraged from its wounds, the spider spat out a huge amount of webbing towards the skeleton. With his web, the monster spider wrapped his web around his opponent's leg, willing him to lose his balance. But that won't stop the skeleton. He swung his sword harder, wanting to cut the nasty web that bound him. But the warrior skeleton had no sooner lowered his sword and destroyed the web than his sword itself became hostage to the spider, which again made the attack. A sharp jerk, and the sword slips out of the skeleton's hands. The skeleton warrior fails to grab it back in time, and the sword flies off in an unknown direction. All the spiders decided to attack and immobilize their opponent. A huge amount of striking web quickly flew out of their mouths. In an instant, the warrior skeleton finds himself in sticky shackles. There's a nasty spider web clinging to all his armor. Once the skeleton's body is fully enveloped, it begins to lift into the air. There are too many webs and the warrior skeleton can't move. His body was stretched like chains in different directions and suspended in the middle of the cave. There were more and more cobwebs around. And spiders started crawling towards him from all sides. They sensed his unarmedness and wanted to enjoy their dinner. The warrior skeleton was struggling to pull the web over itself and tear it apart, but he couldn't do it. And the spiders were getting closer. Their hungry eyes burned ever brighter. And then the biggest and boldest spider swings around to deliver a stabbing blow at its victim. His sharp foot is already flying straight at the skeleton's head, but a warrior doesn't want to give up for nothing. He can't die now. A huge burning pillar appears before his eyes. Fire strikes the spider that wanted to kill the skeleton, and the monster spider is writhing in pain, burning in flames. The skeleton looks at what's going on. He was just almost killed by a spider, and now his enemy is dying. When the fire went out, the skeleton saw Lena in front of him. The girl's face was furious. In her hands, she held the flamethrower she had just burned the spider with. Lena was happy to use this weapon. She loved roasting those nasty spiders. She smiled and said, eat up. She stood and blasted fire at this huge spider that almost ate her companion. The burning spider illuminated the entire cave. Lena's face spoke of her anger at all these things. She walked over to the skeleton. The warrior turned slightly away from the girl. She looked intimidating and asked how she was. Lena barely made it out. While Lena was telling how she was hanging upside down, and blood all came into her face, causing her to scream loudly, there was another spider crawling along the web above her. The shackled skeleton noticed the advancing enemy behind the girl's back and shouted, loudly wanting to warn her. Lena reacted instantly. She turned around and turned on her flamethrower, pointing it directly at the enemy. A huge stream of fire enveloped the monster, and it, like the previous one, screamed and squirmed as it burned. Lena didn't stop firing for a second. 
As one of the spiders lay burning in the fire, it was encircled by his gathering. But so far, none were willing to throw themselves at the companions. And the girl, pleased with herself, waited for the next one with a loaded gun. She pointed the barrel of the flamethrower at the spiders, and they scattered in fear, not wanting to be caught in the flames. Having disposed of her opponents, Lena admired the implement. This thing was pretty good. And now the girl understood perfectly well what the flames inside the bottle were for. The skeleton still stood shackled in the web. But all the spiders were running in the same direction. It didn't seem like they were scared anymore. They acted as if someone had called them out. There, behind a huge black wall, was a passage inside that the skeleton hadn't noticed earlier. Lena took her dagger and began to cut through the webbing to free the skeleton warrior. The spiders that Lena had struck with the fire were still lying on the ground, burning in the bright flames. A screen appeared in front of the skeleton. Combat experience improves levels much faster. The notification stated the new levels of his abilities. Lena jokingly asked as a skeleton his wife. The skeleton answered briefly. She had saved him. Neither of them looked at the other. Before the skeleton could finish speaking, he saw Lena falling. The girl fell to the ground unconscious. She was covered in sweat. The skeleton was very frightened by such an occurrence. He walked over to the girl and lifted her head to make sure she was alive. He called out to her, hoping she would come to her senses. As he looked at his companion, the skeleton noticed three spider bites on her neck. The wounds were affected by the poison that had long ago entered the girl's body. Lena was bitten by spiders, and she urgently needed an antidote. If she doesn't get it soon, she'll die. In one of the caves, there was the wild screaming of a female spider. The humans threatened her with fire and tried to drive her back into their cave. A huge number of men with torches were waving and threatening the monster. They were yelling at her not to move, then cornering her. While one of the men was pushing the others along, a skeleton was watching it all from above. He looked at the Spider Queen and guessed that she was the boss of this dungeon. The guards were discussing the strange behavior of this monster. It was particularly lively today. The skeleton, on the other hand, looked at those who raised these monsters. Those things must have had an antidote for Lena, but how to get to him? A man appeared in front of the Spider Queen. He turned to her loudly, asking how she was doing. The man smiled. He didn't understand the reasons for this behavior. People feed this thing all the time. Around the man's neck was the mark of the Necron Society. A blonde-haired man who looked more like a brigand than a guard stood in the middle of the Spider Queen's eggs. He threatened to fry them if that spider didn't calm down. The loud screams of people were echoing throughout the dungeon. They rushed everyone through the work. The commander was handing out orders while the rest of the men carried the heavy boxes around the cave. The skeleton watched and bided its time. He looked at the man in the center that he talked like a ringleader and threatened the spider lady. It was the bastard commander. He remembered what the crippled man had told him, a pervert, that the captain of the guard ordered them to kill the girl. Remembered the innkeeper's fame before he died, about a guard captain selling girls into slavery to the Necron society. He remembered the dead Rubia, that cheerful girl you lost to that scumbag. And the captain of the guard was cheerful. He laughed at the top of his voice, reveling in his power. His Necron society sign around his neck was like a living thing. At the sight of this man, rage boiled in the skeleton's chest. He clenched his fist tightly, ready to kill the man at any second. The satisfied spider was wrapping its victim in a cocoon of webbing when a voice with a question sounded nearby. One of the guards was poking the prisoners with a stick. He wondered why bother with them like that. Why don't they just kill them in the city? Some of the prisoners were already wrapped in cobwebs and some sat in a semi-conscious state awaiting their fate. One of the older guards told the younger one to shut up and listen to the commander's orders. The junior guard fell silent. Behind him, a skeleton warrior was quietly coming out of hiding. His sword was ready. A plan had already matured in his mind. The captain of the guards turned around with a displeased face at the shout of one of his soldiers. At the younger guard's throat was a sword. He asked for help from his captain. The skeleton grabbed the younger guard tightly and threatened to kill him. The young Palinek sought the protection of the older one. But it seems the captain of the guard was unhappy with the invasion of his territory. The captain of the guard was caught in a vice. He asked a bunch of questions about who this man was and what he was doing here. No one was supposed to know about this place. The skeleton ignored all questions. He set his own terms. 
and there were only two options. The first is the voluntary transfer of the antidote. He reiterated once more about needing the antidote and squeezed the young lad tighter into the vice. Everyone around them whispered about the antidote. The skeleton asked me to give it to him nicely. The captain asked if the warrior would let his subordinate live. But the skeleton said the captain of the guard would die quickly and painlessly, and all his men will walk out of here alive. After saying those words, the captain of the guard laughed loudly. That laughter made the skeleton warrior question the situation at hand. The captain tapped himself on the head. He thought of the warrior in front of him as just another junkie. He'd met a few before, but he'd never seen one this crazy before. With his gruff smile, the captain of the guard reminded the warrior of who he was. How dare a warrior threaten him? But the skeleton told him about a few months a girl came to Ublam to buy armor, but died. And now the warrior is wearing that very armor. Hearing this, the guard captain smiled widely. He realized that the warrior had come to avenge his girlfriend. The captain called the warrior skeleton stupid, which confused him. A caustic smirk never left the guard captain's face. Rubia wasn't the only girl this happened to. He doesn't memorize them. The warrior skeleton was silent. He looked at the man with contempt and decided what to do next. Next, he beheaded a young guard. The captain of the guard had no intention of settling the matter amicably. The guy's dead body slowly rolled to the ground. The skeleton let go of the guy's body and ran to avenge the captain. As he moved, bottles, shards, and yellow liquid flew at him, sticking to his armor. The captain of the guard and his soldiers stood and laughed. They threw eggs at the skeleton warrior. Right on the skeleton's helmet was the yolk of an egg, and looming over his head was the spider queen. She was angry. In those eggs were her children. One of the spider queen's legs flew like an arrow to strike the one who had the remains of her children on him. The skeleton warrior sensed the danger and turned around to repel the attack. Immediately, he froze unmoving. The tip of his sword was broken and flew off the main part. The warrior skeleton was stabbed through and through by the spider queen's sharp foot, and his sword was stuck in her leg, so they stood there without moving. Folding his arms across his chest, the captain of the guard smiled haughtily. He knew the warrior's body reeked of spider eggs, so the spider attacked him. The skeleton warrior's body began to slowly rise upwards. He couldn't hold his sword, and it fell to the ground. To him, he was the thief of her children. The skeleton was hanging on the spider queen's leg almost unconscious. His body was like a rag hanging from a branch, and the spider queen scrutinized her prey. There were rumors among the people that the queen was a chimera, that the wizards who created her left her for dead. But how much is the life-giving power of a mother's love? While the guards left the scene thinking the warrior was finished, he had the strength to fight on. The captain of the guard, even turning around one last time, didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. He thought about the fact that he had fed the queen's spiders for the day, and it was time for them to leave. But behind his back came a deafening explosion. The pillar of fire rose so high that it was ready to consume everything in its path. The spider queen was on fire. She screamed in pain and heat. Her scream was agonizing, full of pain and suffering. The fire was devouring her more and more. A wall of fire and smoke separated the guards and the skeleton warrior. The captain of the guard was startled to see the one who had created this chaos. The guards behind him were ready to run away from the approaching monster, and the captain couldn't move from his seat looking at him. No, it wasn't a man or a monster. It was a warrior, a skeleton. He held a loaded flamethrower in his hands and sprinkled on himself from a bag of powder that the blacksmith had given him. This powder should protect him from the heat of the flames. The skeleton's determined look said he warned once, and there's already been a warning. The skeleton warrior stood in a fighting stance and charged the flamethrower. He warned that the death of the captain of the guard would be extremely agonizing, and fired a pillar of fire. The captain of the guard found no choice but to rush away from the fire. Huge flames rose throughout the cave. The spider queen was burning, but she was alive. The spider woman screamed from the heat. She looked at what the skeleton was doing to the captain. At the cry of her queen, her children ran to her aid. They slid down from the ceiling on their web and hovered over the skeletal warrior. Reacting quickly, the skeleton aimed his fire weapon at the spiders that were trying to eat him. Everything around was on fire. People running in flames were burning Vessi and walls. The cocoons of webbed people that were suspended from the ceiling in the cave dangled and burned. 
The people inside were still alive, but couldn't get out and save themselves. The fire spread quickly. The heat was so intense that the walls began to melt. The captain of the guard sat near the wall, engulfed in flames. He tried to blow it off of him, and he wasn't smiling anymore. The skin on his face was melting and his face was becoming more ugly than it had previously been with the scar on his cheek. The fire across his body was rising higher and higher. The captain of the guard was on his knees and begged the skeleton warrior to spare him. He promised to do whatever the man asked if the skeleton would let him live. The skeleton came closer and closer to the hapless captain. His bones were already burning, but he was still on his feet and threatening. This man was finished. The skeleton charged the flamethrower and let loose a huge jet of fire directly at the captain of the guard. The man's entire body was engulfed in flames. The man screamed in pain. He was burned alive. The skeleton stood inebriated with his vengeance. He threatened to kill every bastard that abused and killed Rubia. The whole cave was ablaze with fire. All the bodies turned to ash. The temperature was so great that the gloves on the skeleton's hands began to melt. Lena was dead. The poison from the spider bite killed her. The fire was getting closer and closer to her. A fever engulfed the entire dungeon. The bones of the warrior skeleton became soft and turned into liquid flowing downward. His spine couldn't take the strain, and his skull fell to the ground. The skeleton didn't understand why this was happening. After all, the powder was supposed to protect him. The skull lay on the ground, and the empty eye sockets expressed hopelessness. He was dying. All around lay the burning bodies of people, and a skeleton whose bones had melted. A rebirth awaited him. A blue notification appeared on rebirth. The dungeon's fusion level had dropped to 90%. Waking up in the dungeon, the skeleton quickly regained consciousness and stood up. He looked at the peacefully sleeping Lena beside him. She was asleep and didn't suspect a thing. She was alive. The skeleton died again, and after being reborn, he found himself in the first of his dungeons where he lived with Lena. The blue screen indicated that the data transfer was complete, but the skeleton still didn't fully remember the reason for his rebirth. The skeleton was very angry. He, on the other hand, sprinkled powder on himself and felt no fever. So why did he die? Meanwhile, behind the skeleton's back, Lena woke up. She was very sleepy and rubbing her eyes. While the skeleton realized what was wrong, she asked him why he woke up so early. The skeleton rose from the ground immediately. He said they are moving out on the road. With that, he caught the girl off guard and she asked a lot of questions. The warrior skeleton answered only one question. They're headed to Jublum. The companions again visited the shop, where they were again denied the sale of the necessary items because they were unavailable. The skeleton, standing under the tree, listened to the same words about the necessary goods being sold out. But he had other things on his mind. Hearing the right phrase with which the shopkeeper threw Lena out and refused to sell her anything, the skeleton snapped out of his thoughts. He grabbed the girl by the arm and ran with her away from the store. They were followed by a man, just like last time. Seeing that the skeleton and the girl had fled the store, he, smiling, came out of his hiding place but he was immediately pressed against the wall with a swift movement. The skeleton knew where the blacksmith would be hiding and was able to make his threat better. The warrior skeleton held the blacksmith firmly by the neck with his hand. I was ready to strangle him at the slightest movement. The blacksmith seemed unafraid of him. The skeleton hurried things along. He already knew what was happening at this very moment, and he told it all himself for the blacksmith. He hurried him to get to the forge faster. Since the skeleton was saying everything so verbatim, everything the blacksmith was thinking, the man was more frightened of him than he had been the last time. Once in the forge, in which everything was exactly the same as in my previous life, the skeleton waited for the conversation to begin. The warrior skeleton stood silently and listened to the story for a second time. He was biding his time. And so the blacksmith searches for what caused the skeleton's death. Though according to the blacksmith, it was supposed to protect them. Lena has already found the Grasmere fire, all the same rapturous emotions at the sight of this marvel. The girl was carrying on a conversation with the blacksmith about it being an unquenchable flame, and the skeleton was waiting for the moment. The skeleton looked at the flame in the flask. That's what killed him last time. It lit up and never went out again. The skeleton asked if the blacksmith had a tool to use that fire. 
The man hadn't expected strangers to be so knowledgeable about his hometown. He handed the skeleton a flamethrower, and the weapon lay in the warrior's hands as if he had never parted with it. Meanwhile, the blacksmith had found a bag of powder. He again told them that by sprinkling themselves with it, they would not feel the heat. That's exactly what was supposed to save the skeleton, but in the end, along with the fire, it destroyed him. The skeleton was so angry at the man that he grabbed a sack from the table and hit the blacksmith in the face with it. Lena did not expect such behavior of her companion and shrieked in surprise. The powder was left on the man's face and head. Its vapors flew in the air, and the blacksmith didn't understand why he deserved such an attitude. The warrior skeleton pointed a weapon at the man. With fear, the blacksmith stopped breathing. The skeleton repeated the words that with the powder he would feel no heat. Smith began waving his arms, asking them not to let fire into him and to stop. The warrior kept his finger on the trigger. He decided to try out this powder for starters. The blacksmith admitted that the powder would make it so that he would feel no heat or pain. The skeleton, hearing the acknowledgement, raised the muzzle of the weapon upward. The warrior skeleton grabbed the man by the neck in anger. He talked about how it would be helpful first. Lifting the man up so that his feet didn't touch the ground, the skeleton continued. Then the warrior simply won't notice when his armor starts to melt. He held the man above the floor and asked why he wanted to kill the companions along with the guards. The man didn't seem to feel an ounce of guilt. The blacksmith knew it wasn't a man lurking beneath the armor. After these words, the skeleton warrior shoved the man to the other end of the room. That one fell with a clatter, and the things in the closet fell on top of it. Kneeling on his knees, the man tried to cough and regain consciousness after the strangulation, and the skeleton demanded to know how he knew he wasn't human. The man raised his head and gritted his teeth. He has been in the blacksmithing business for over fifty years. He saw and noticed perfectly well that underneath the armor he had made was not a man hiding. Trying to get up, he called the skeleton a creature and a monster and didn't understand why he needed all of this. But before dying, in the blacksmith's opinion, the monster would have time to do a good deed. Lena intervened in the conversation. She clenched her fists in anger and didn't understand what the old fool was talking about. The girl appealed to the warrior to kill the wretched man, but the skeleton spat at him. There was no point in killing someone who already had one foot in the grave. The skeleton turned menacingly and headed for the exit. There was no point for the blacksmith to worry about the guards. The skeleton warrior would have killed them anyway. Lena was surprised by his words. On the way out, the skeleton saw a sword sticking out of a rock. He looked at him. The sword seemed pretty sturdy. The skeleton remembered how fragile his sword had been in battle. It didn't look like one that wouldn't dull quickly. Seeing the skeleton take the sword, the blacksmith shouted that it was not for sale. It took the man years to get it. But the skeleton warrior had no plans to give it up and placed it against the man's neck. But the skeleton said that this sword was payment for trying to kill those who wanted to help him. The blacksmith was silent. Stabbing the man with the tip of his sword, the skeleton warrior asked if the blacksmith had any objections to this. The dark sky was almost cloudless. The skeleton stood in front of the dungeon entrance. Now he was facing a tough battle. In his past life, he had lost it. Lena held a flamethrower in her hands. They were standing in front of the entrance to the remains of the spider's nest. Lena tried not to get discouraged. Since the powder the blacksmith wanted to give them was useless, they should be careful with fire. The girl cautiously entered the dungeon and hummed softly to herself. The skeleton was in no hurry to enter. He stood silently, pondering his next move. He remembered how Lena had died. She was bitten by a poisonous spider, and then thanks to it, she was burned. As he approached his companion, he apologized to her which made the girl wary. He hit Lena, didn't kill her, just made her unconscious. The girl went limp and fell to the ground. The warrior skeleton gently lifted the girl into his arms. He was sorry to hurt her, but the skeleton wanted to protect her. He carefully leaned the girl's unconscious body against the cave wall. She's died so many times before because of him. He won't let it happen again. Lena didn't hear that. She was sleeping peacefully. Looking at the sleeping girl, the warrior asked her to rest. It was time for him to leave. The skeleton warrior flew into the now familiar cave with a quick step, pulling his sword from its sheath. On his way, he promised to return soon. Sparks of fire were already blazing in the caves. The spiders were burning and running everywhere looking for escape. They made nasty noises as they died. 
and the skeleton kept moving forward. The Grasmere fire was truly dangerous. Warrior needs to be more careful with that one. The skeleton was careful and precise. He had to be more careful, and then he could kill them all at once. Voices were heard behind the skeleton warrior. Someone asked what he was doing in that cave. Turning his head in the direction of the voice, the skeleton saw the captain of the guard and two guards in front of him. It seems their leader was not happy with what he saw. The captain of the guard looked toward the fire and realized it was his spiders burning. The warrior skeleton pointed his weapon at the captain and called out to him to talk. The junior guard whispered something to his commander. The captain of the guard stepped forward showing that he was unarmed. The man told the skeleton that this cave was dangerous. There were many confusing paths. Thinking that this strange warrior was lost, he offered to lead him out. He said they were guards from a town nearby and could help him. But his face did not express the sincerity of the words. The captain of the guards held a bottle of strange liquid behind his back. Moving closer and closer to the wary warrior, the man asked if he liked eggs. Skeleton knew what would follow and firmly said no. The skeleton grabbed his sword and prepared to strike. The blow was accurate and quick. With it, he prevented a bottle of liquid from hitting himself and wounding the captain of the guard. With a loud clang, the bottle shattered on the ground and shards of liquid flew in all directions. The guard stood ready to begin the battle behind their commander. The captain didn't know how the warrior could have anticipated his actions. He held onto his wounded shoulder and tried to recognize who was standing in front of him. The warrior skeleton stood opposite his enemy. Both scrutinized each other carefully. The captain of the guard did not know that the warrior had made a promise to him. In a past life, the skeleton had promised him a painful death. Blood was oozing from the wound on his shoulder. The captain thought he was crazy. No one expected to hear such words from an unfamiliar warrior. An order was given by the captain. The guard standing in wait rushed to attack the warrior skeleton, and he prepared a flamethrower and waited for them to come closer. When the guard saw the red light coming from the muzzle of the weapon, they stopped in fear. No shields could save them from the fire consuming them. The skeleton, not waiting until they were close, shot straight at the humans. And now they were burning and screaming like spiders. The captain of the guard, standing farthest away, saw his soldiers burning. He didn't want to get caught in the fire at all, so he decided to run away. As the fire came out of the flamethrower, the skeleton remembered a past lesson. He couldn't use the Grasmere fire for long, or it would melt again. The warrior skeleton kept enough distance to keep himself from getting hurt. He wanted to burn every last one of them. People were burning alive. Their clothes and bodies were melting, causing great pain. Behind the skeleton, the captain of the guard appeared. With one hand, he held his wounded shoulder. In his other hand, he held a dagger wanting to attack the warrior. Gathering all his strength, he rushed to attack the one who had started the fire here and wounded him. The skeleton, noticing the movement behind him, turned around. It seems that in burning the guards, he forgot about his main opponent. The skeleton warrior did not have time to fend off the guard captain's attack. He hit the target with a precision, knocking the flamethrower out of his hands. The guard captain's dagger sliced the flamethrower in half while simultaneously shattering the vial of Grasmere fire. This incident made the skeleton nervous. The skeleton stood looking at the burning flamethrower. The captain of the guard was pleased with himself. He didn't know where the warrior had gotten such a weapon from, but he wouldn't be able to use it again. The feet of the spider queen appeared out of the cramped space. The skeleton burned all the spider eggs and pissed her off. Looking under his feet, the captain saw one whole egg and bent down to pick it up. The captain of the guard stood in front of the spider queen and threatened her. He demanded her obedience if she was to keep her last child. The queen listened to him attentively. The man ordered her to kill the warrior, and she rushed to attack the man she had indicated. The skeleton was ready for the meeting. He held out the sword in front of him that the blacksmith was so reluctant to give up. The Spider Queen's strikes were swift. The warrior skeleton barely had time to deflect the attack. A column of dust rose from the active battle between the skeleton and the queen. The skeleton jumped aside. He landed and tried to catch his breath. The Spider Queen was very evil and strong. The warrior is tired. He barely had time to block her blows with his sword. He didn't understand what was happening or what to do. If he had fire, but he had fire. Ahead of him, his flamethrower was still burning. Suddenly the skeleton received another blow from the spider, which threw him back against another wall. 
This blow was immediately followed by a second. The skeleton warrior barely had time to put his sword out in front of him to avoid being severely wounded. While there was an active battle going on between the warrior and the queen, the shouts of the captain of the guard could be heard. He was insulting the skeleton. He was sure the skeleton couldn't handle the spider. It was impossible to follow the movement of the queen's feet and sword. After another blow, the skeleton stumbled back. He couldn't keep his balance and started to fall. Lying on the ground, the skeleton looked up at the rapidly approaching spider queen. She hovered over him like death, threatening him with all her limbs. Thinking had to be quick. One of the spider's legs was already near his body. The skeleton warrior turned his head to see how close his gun was burning. Grasmere fire flowed out of the container and spread over the ground, causing the flames to move. The skeleton was in danger. With a piercing scream, the spider queen began to attack her opponent. The skeleton immediately decided to act. He had no other choice and rushed toward the fire. The spider woman's blow hit the skeleton's helmet. The impact made the helmet fall off his head and shatter. Watching the battle, the wounded captain smiled. His face looked mad. The wound in his shoulder was still bleeding. He had the last egg in his hands. He didn't care about the skeleton's threats. He wished he could become the spider's lunch sooner. The spider queen stopped. She watched what the warrior, a skeleton, was trying to do. And what she saw frightened her. Her legs were engulfed in flames. She shouted. Bringing her legs up, she tried to put them out. But with each movement, the fire covered her body more and more. The spider woman fell down. She couldn't move with her legs burning. Her cry pleaded for help. The startled captain began to back away. A menacing warrior, a skeleton, was looming over him. In the skeleton's hands was a burning sword. His bare skull reflected the flames burning in his hands. The captain of the guard couldn't believe what he was seeing. The skeleton warned the captain of the guard that he would not get off easy. The spider woman was wounded. Green blood was already gushing out of her. She was like slime. But the spider queen didn't want to give up. The skeleton struck again and again with his sword. It was his turn to throw crushing blows. The sword strike sent green liquid flying in different directions. With a strong jerk, the skeleton warrior pushed off the ground. He flew straight at the bleeding spider queen. The skeleton brought the burning sword high above his head, putting all his strength into the strike. Not an ounce of doubt was on the warrior's face, and the spider queen screamed in fear and pain before striking. The warrior skeleton began his strike right as he flew. He pierced the entire body of the spider queen with his sword. She screamed in pain in a way that shook the walls in the dungeon. She no longer had the strength to resist and stand on her feet. The spider queen fell into her own pool of blood, and the skeleton was standing next to the one he defeated. The sword in his hands did not fade. The spider queen's red eyes were going out. Blood was slowly coming out of his mouth and body. She died in silence. The skeleton warrior bowed his head over the slain dungeon master, lowering his sword. The captain of the guard looked at what had happened. The surviving egg was still in his hands. The man couldn't believe the spider woman had lost to the warrior. He wasn't even human. How could this happen? The captain of the guard decided to take his sword in hand and spring into action, leaving all questions in his head. As he accelerated, he swung his sword right behind the skeleton warrior's back. While the man stood still and didn't move, the man wanted to catch him off guard. But no sooner had the guard captain struck his blow than the thin blade of the skeleton's sword left him without an arm and sword. The skeleton's burning sword was even sharper than before, and the skeleton was attentive enough to prevent the blow. The captain of the guard fell to his knees and wept for his lost arm, and the skeleton stood in front of him. He glared at his opponent. Skeleton said there was no need to worry about bleeding. The flames cauterized the wound and stopped the bleeding. He'd be very upset if the captain died prematurely from blood loss. Then the skeleton would not be able to keep his promise in the captain's agonizing death. The man was covered in sweat from the pain. He shuddered and called the skeleton sick. The captain of the guard was afraid of him. The captain of the guard began to look around for his men. He asked them to get rid of the skeleton warrior. He himself was no longer capable of fighting. But all his guards were dead. They burned alive. The remains of their bodies were still smoldering. If you touch them, there'll be ashes on the ground. The warrior skeleton voiced what the captain had seen aloud. All the guards are dead. The captain of the guard was starting to go crazy with fear. He screamed and called for help from the spiders. 
The loud scream made the veins all over my body swell and ready to burst. The spiders lay on the ground and didn't move. They were hot instead of poison. Smoke came out of them. All the spiders were dead too, the skeleton pronounced. The captain's eyes were ready to fall out of his eye sockets from tension and hopelessness. He was still looking for someone to kill that nasty skeleton. Due to his inability to stand up from his wounds, the captain of the guard crawled. He looked flawed. He was no longer the arrogant man who wanted to trick the skeleton into killing him. A trail of blood was left on the ground beneath the man. The flames from the fire began to devour the captain of the guard a little at a time. Seeing the fire on himself made him even crazier. He stared at the fire that was burning his clothes, as if he could get rid of it with one look. As soon as the fire reached his naked body, the man felt pain. He began to quickly shake it off with his hands. But the air was making him more and more, and the captain was in more and more pain. The captain of the guard stomped in place, trying to get the fire away from him. He asked him not to burn. It was as if the fire had heard him. The skeleton warrior took a step towards the captain, wanting to warn him of what was behind him. But the man, thrusting forward a whole burning hand, shouted not to come near him. He beat with his whole hand the fire that was devouring his stump of an arm. The fire wouldn't go out. It was a real curse. And then the captain's foot slipped down the stone cliff. The captain of the guard realized he was falling. That's exactly what the skeleton wanted to warn him about. And the skeleton warrior stood motionless watching his opponent fall. Walking to the edge of the cliff, the warrior crouched down and looked down at the fallen man. The skeleton looked down and watched the guard captain burn. The man's body had already completely merged with the fire. They became one. The flames engulfed the man, causing him hellish suffering. The warrior skeleton watching it all thought it was a stupid death. The warrior stood up on the edge of the cliff, still holding his unsheathed sword. That was the end of the battle. The warrior skeleton looked at his burning sword. He wanted to keep it, but carrying it around with him all the time was too dangerous. Therefore, he made the decision to leave this sword here. The skeleton unclenched his palm, and the sword began to fall into the abyss. It was time for the warrior to return to Lena. But apparently not so fast. The Spider Queen was still alive. She, slowly bleeding, crawled toward the cliff where the skeleton stood. From the spider's mouth came a sound that caught the skeleton's attention, and he turned around, not expecting that the spider was still alive. The Spider Queen's view was not good at all. All the wounds bled with poison and blood, but she had the strength to continue the battle. The warrior skeleton was in a desperate situation. He just threw away his sword, and now he was lying on the ground in the precipice illuminating the ground. The weakened spider raised its leg and poked at the skeleton with it. Her movements were slowed, but her tentacles were still sharp. One of them was approaching the skeleton's skull. He was scared, but he didn't move. A tentacle was about to touch his face. But it passed by without hitting a bone on his skull. The spider's leg dipped beneath the skeleton's legs, wanting to pick up the last surviving egg. The spider queen took her last child and cradled it to her chest. The skeleton stood amazed at such great care. The spider woman clutched the egg tighter to her chest, kissing him and making affectionate soothing noises. She made her last sounds and passed out. As her body lost its strength, she began to fall. The dead body of the spider queen fell, but she never let the egg out of her hands. The skeleton stepped closer to the mother of spiders. He looked at the spider queen and thought about how she only wanted to protect her egg. The dead spider's body began to burn. Her surviving egg burst. A red rock rolled out of the egg right under the skeleton's feet. Instantly, a blue screen appeared. It had new data on it. He had defeated the dungeon master. The difficulty level was despair, and the soldier's points had been increased by 400%. He also has a new ability to increase his speed for 30 minutes. That's when a new challenge began. The warrior skeleton was coming out of the dungeon. On his shoulders, he carried a huge, heavy sack. The girl's loud words made him stop. She talked about her feelings, and she felt betrayed. She was standing at the entrance to the dungeons, and her entire appearance expressed great displeasure and anger towards the skeleton. Her fury burned brighter than the fire in the cave. Could she really be so untrustworthy that the skeleton left her here and went there alone? The skeleton warrior had nothing to say, so he silently removed the sack from his shoulders and held it out to the girl. Lena asked the warrior what it was and revealed it at the same time. Inside, the sack was full of gold coins. They glistened brightly in the sun. 
the warrior wanted to pay off that sack, and by the looks of it, he succeeded. The girl grabbed the bag, clutching it to her, and turned away to hide the feelings that appeared there. Still trying to be angry, Lena spoke through her teeth about how she would try to be stronger and not be a burden. She asked the skeleton not to do that to her anymore. They headed onward. We walked past rocks and forests. Skeleton asked where they were going now. Lena was pleased. She asked the warrior to follow her and wanted to take him to a branch of her guild. The warrior skeleton could only ask about what kind of guild branch this was. There were boys in cotton shirts running down the street. There were a lot of kids. There were little ones that were still playing with the bears and older ones that were chasing each other. They all lived in a huge brick house that looked like an administration building. This is where Lena brought the skeleton. The warrior froze and didn't move, looking at all these fun, playing children. He couldn't believe that this was her guild branch. A little girl in a pink dress ran up to the companions. She threw herself around Lena's neck, calling her little sister. Never had the skeleton seen a girl so happy. She hugged the little girl, also calling her sister. Lifting her sister in her arms, Lena introduced the skeleton as the knight who had saved her. The little girl said hello to the knight. Both were very similar to each other. Their broad smiles were like two drops alike. Children surrounded Lena from all sides. They were happy to see her, and they all called her sister. She tried to hug each of them. From behind the crowd came a very unchildlike voice that said hello to Lena. It was the head of the guild branch, a guy not tall but with a huge blinding smile. The companions made their way to the head's office. In the tall cabinets were a multitude of books. The head of the branch politely offered the girl tea. Sitting at the table, the head and the girl exchanged amiable concern for each other. Meanwhile, the skeleton was looking at the skull he found in the study. Lena pointed at the warrior. She introduced him as a knight who had helped her more than once. Caught off guard, the skeleton didn't know what to say. The head pressed his hand to his chest and bowed respectfully in deference to the knight. His name was Lime, and he was the head of this orphanage. The skeleton stood flat in front of Lime. He was silent and unmoving. The head of the orphanage didn't expect such a reaction and broke the silence with his words. He suggested that the knight must be uncomfortable in the armor and offered to take it off. In response, Lime received a firm rejection. Skeleton didn't plan to undress, but the head of the shelter was persistent. He was perfectly fine with seeing what lurked beneath the armor. Not expecting such words, the skeleton bowed his head to the head. He didn't know how his interlocutor had guessed his secret. All three heard a piercing cry for help and turned toward the door. Lena, rising from her chair, asked what it could be. Cold as ice, the principal mouthed the fact that they were visited by uninvited guests. Smiling politely at the skeleton warrior, Lime asked to continue their conversation later. The three brigands stood in the middle of the children. One of the men held the little red-haired girl's hand tightly. According to them, it was clear that the girl had escaped from a gang of robbers, and those finally found him. The heavy-set man gripped the girl's small hand so tightly that her feet barely touched the ground. The shelter director approached them and clarified if they had any problems. The brigands didn't plan on being polite. The shelter director introduced himself and asked to release the child to continue the conversation. A man who looked like a bandit replied that they ran an orphanage in a neighboring village, and this kid ran away from them. This girl caught the eye of the patron of the outlaw orphanage, the Count himself. This little girl was to be the Count's adopted daughter, and because of her escape, the shelter now has a lot of problems. The brigands switched to shouting. Principal Lime was completely cold-blooded. Can't a child who is mistreated in foster care run away from it? The man was looking for a fight. Such words made him angry, and he wanted to pounce on the principal, but he was stopped by a woman's hand. A stern woman in a dress held the angry man down with one hand. She wasn't at all interested in how Principal Lime treated her children. She talked about how this girl needed to be brought back. The woman offered to take her quietly and forget about them coming here, but Lime smilingly said that the girl was now in his orphanage and he couldn't do that. Apparently, the woman was the head of these brigands. She offered the shelter director a deal. After all, he's probably just as likely to capitalize on the children as they are. She began to say the terms of the deal, that the principal would give the kids they needed, but she didn't have time to finish. Principal Lime firmly cut off her conversation with his refusal. The rejection made the woman angry, but she gave Lime a second chance and interrogated him, 
but he also repeated that he was refusing the offer. Principal Lime's wide smile made him look more like a child. He said he doesn't use children for his own gain like some pig. The brigands grinned their face. They thought he was a smart enough guy and would want to settle the matter peacefully. But now it was too late. The woman ordered to kill the principal, and the two men drew their swords and rushed towards the guy. The skeleton warrior and Lena stood behind and watched. Skeleton wanted to offer his help, but the girl replied that she wasn't needed. Apparently she knew what was going to happen next, and said that the only people who need help here are the idiots who trespassed on someone else's territory. The brigands were already near Principal Lime and swung their swords to strike. The clangs of swords striking were heard. The woman reveled in victory. She thought the principal was a fool for not agreeing to her terms. She waited for the dead body. But I saw something unexpected. What she saw made her eyes pop out of her orbits and she sweated with fear. The woman watched her companions drown in the green liquid as it entered their bodies and suffocated before she could call for help. Principal Lime's hands produced this liquid, green and viscous, like a swamp it lingered. He asked how do small and pure children grow up to be so ugly and stupid. The woman watched in horror. One of the principal's eyes was completely red. With that look, he looked more like a monster than a human, but his smile was still as innocent. The female brigand clenched her fists in terror. She screamed. She asked what the principal was. Principal Lime swung his arms and a fountain of green liquid headed straight for his opponent and surrounded her. She didn't have time to escape the wave coming at her and began to sink. She screamed, but no one came to her aid. The warrior skeleton took a step forward. He was very amazed at what he saw and was tormented by the question of how the principal had done it. Lena, on the other hand, was pleased and proud of the guy. The green liquid vaporized and clothes fell out of it. Principal Lime politely clarified why the skeleton was so surprised. Standing surrounded by what was left of the outlaw's clothes, the director turned to his guests and decided to introduce himself properly. He's a slime, manager of the eastern branch of the guild. The principal's eye was still glowing red. There were all kinds of inorganic things lying on the ground. Dresses, shirts, swords, and even jewelry. There was no sign of the people who wore it. In the midst of this chaos stood the principal. Children were already starting to approach them from different directions. Skeleton asked what the guy was. Principal Lime was one of the metamorphoses. He was a slime. Despite the cruel acts that had just occurred, the principal remained polite. He asked if he could call himself undead trying to live in the human world like the skeleton. Skeleton knew that intelligent slugs were very rare and could be counted on their fingers, and it's almost impossible to see one with your own eyes. The principal was hugging the little girl that they just wanted to take her away. He ruined their plans. The skeleton was worried. These brigands were supported by the authorities. There's gonna be trouble. Lime lifted the girl into his arms. She lifted it up warmly. The director could join the human guild, but he did not join of his own volition. When he destroys such things, it doesn't bring him any problems. The guy's smile grew wider and wider. How proud Lena was of the orphanage director. She was bursting with the importance of knowing such an unusual person. The hot tea was re-poured into mugs. Lena and the skeleton sat at the table while the principal tried to woo them. The warrior had a question. Why was the slime running a human shelter? Lime carefully placed the mug of hot drink in front of the skeleton. The boy went to the window and looked dreamily out into the street. Their species has no gender and no relationship with children. The principal looked at the children and continued to answer the question. He likes people because as they grow up, they become very different from each other. And most species, even when grown, look the same. Lime turned to his companions. Yes, slime can choose any shape it wants, but it will be just an outer shell. And if you look at the real them, they are completely shapeless creatures. At these words, the principal's gaze became sad. The guy was kind enough to offer to turn into a skeleton so the warrior would feel more comfortable talking. But the warrior didn't want that. He wanted to know how the director realized he was a skeleton. Lena answered for Lime. The principal was an appraiser. The concept was unfamiliar to the warrior. The principal covered his eyes awkwardly. Thanks to the appraisal skill, he can handle any job in the guild. It was one of the features of the slime. The principal knew that the skeleton warrior had helped Lena a lot. In return for that, he could appreciate something for him. But what's a skeleton to give for evaluation? 
he remembered the gift from the dungeon, the remains of a spider's nest. The skeleton held out a huge red ruby in his hand, asking Lime to appraise it. The director was attracted to the rock. He eyed him curiously. Taking it from the skeleton's hand, he asked him to hold it for a minute. The ruby was so big that it didn't even fit in the guy's two hands. Holding the stone between her palms, Slime and the stone began to glow green. And in an instant, the principal's fingers began to lose their shape and turn into slime. Then her palms spread over the stone, enveloping the green swamp liquid around it. And now all that was left of the principal was a liquid that completely engulfed the stone and hung in the air. The warrior skeleton looked at all this and realized why Lena was so calm with him. Because the orphanage she grew up in was run by a monster. A talking skeleton doesn't compare to what Lena has seen since she was a little girl. The warrior looked at the headmaster as he appraised the ruby. He was thrilled to see the living slime. The skeleton saw the end of Principal Lime's action and jumped up from his seat awaiting the verdict. The owner of the shelter smiled broadly and said that after an appraisal, he found out that the ruby was very valuable. A notification appeared on the blue screen that the spinning web ruby could be used for great evolution. When you use it, the proximity to the arachnids will increase slightly. Insect damage will increase. Next, a second notification appeared that the dungeon fusion percentage had been reduced to 88 units. After reducing the value of the dungeon fusion, the skeleton's skull was crushed. Noticing the warrior's ill health, Principal Lime immediately reacted and inquired about his health. It was hard enough for the skeleton not to pretend to feel bad. He decided to change the subject, noting that the orphanage owner had very good powers. Principal Lime stepped closer to help the warrior stand on his feet, and it wasn't about ability at all. Hearing the question about how the headmaster could help the skeleton, the warrior immediately reacted and asked if the man had any swords. Director Lime hesitated. It was necessary to visit the blacksmith in the village. The skeleton's armor still needed to be repaired. Upon hearing about the armor, the skeleton immediately began to refuse. He didn't want to part with them. But Lime was adamant. The warrior skeleton has kept Lena safe for a long time, and this is the least he can do to thank him. The skeleton will be given a room to rest while his gear is being repaired. The skeleton's armor was indeed cracked after numerous battles, and he was tired, so he gladly accepted the offer. Night had fallen over the stone walls of the orphanage. Lena lit up the walls like it was daytime. The skeleton's thin fingers held a large ruby. The warrior stood in front of the window as naked without his armor. He lifted the stone in his hands to get a better look at it in the moonlight. He thought about the notification, about changing your class with a ruby. The warrior skeleton turned around. He was summoned by the voice of a girl who entered. Standing in front of the window in the cold moonlight, the skeleton looked small and weak. He looked at the girl waiting for her reaction. She stood in front of him without her hiking clothes, too. Lena smiled as she looked at the warrior. It was the first time she'd seen him without his armor. Her wide, good-natured smile was changing her face. It seemed childlike. Lena awkwardly asked about the stars. Skeleton, stepping away from the window, said he was just thinking. Lena was supposed to be with her sister right now. But Lena's sister was already asleep. And if a girl goes to bed with her, she'll ask to stay longer. At the mention of her sister, Lena lowered her head. She spoke sadly of dreaming of the day when they could live together. Skeleton hadn't expected to hear such a confession. He couldn't find the words quickly, so he just stared at the girl. Lena held out her golden pendant to the skeleton warrior again. She had already given it to a skeleton in a past life. That day was clearly in front of his eyes. Lena, without raising her eyes, talked about how she was too young to remember where he was from. But he was around her neck when the girl was left at the orphanage. The naked skeleton accepted the girl's medallion, but he didn't understand why she gave it to him. Lena still didn't look at the warrior in the same way. She said he would have the medallion exactly until the day she took over as manager, and he accomplished his mission. The locket dangled and made a metallic sound. The gleam of metal slightly mesmerized the skeleton's gaze. Lena took in a full chest of air and raised her head. Putting a hand to her heart, she mustered up the courage to ask if the skeleton would stay with her after their pact was over. The skeleton looked at the girl. His eyes burned. This question had touched his heart so deeply. But the answer hung in the silence of the night. 
The companions continued to stare at each other in silence. The next day, when the sun was already reflecting brightly off the roofs of the shelter, the skeleton warrior had already tried on his armor after the repairs and was pleased with the comfort it brought. The skeleton was glad the repairs only took one day. The director was worried that the warrior wouldn't be happy with the mending. Just like that, Lime held out the sword the warrior had requested. It was new, smooth, and sharp. Taking it in his hands, the skeleton marveled at the quality of the blacksmith's craftsmanship. The sword was strong and light. Skeleton couldn't be happy about such an acquisition. He raised the new sword in his hand and scrutinized it in the sunlight. The skeleton was restrained and said that this sword was quite good. The warrior apologized to the principal for causing no small amount of trouble. But the director was not bothered by these troubles. Lena entered the office quietly. The skeleton's gaze and Lena's made contact. They got embarrassed. The girl turned away from the warrior in a hurry. She was uncomfortable looking at him. The skeleton kept his gaze on Lena. There were many things he wanted to say, but he remained silent. The director watched the behavior of the companions and did not understand what had happened between them in just one night. Principal Lime took a seat at his desk. He wondered where the skeleton warrior was going now. The warrior turned around. He didn't know where he should go. I guess he should be looking for a new dungeon, but I'm not sure if he should. Hearing that the skeleton was hesitant to proceed, the director suggested that the warrior join the guild, invited him to become a member of the T and T clan. Skeleton hadn't expected such a suggestion. He was knocked to the ground, turned around and questioned the principal about the offer. Director Lime was very knowledgeable. He knew that the skeleton was helping Miss Lena to get information about the Necron community. But Lena's an intern, and she doesn't have access to the database. And if a warrior joins, the director will send him a recommendation, and he will immediately become a full member of the guild. The director of the orphanage thought that the skeleton would make an excellent member of the guild. It wasn't a simple admiration. It was a professional look. After listening to all of the shelter owner's arguments, the skeleton warrior froze, pondering his proposal. Principal Lime, waiting in momentary silence, began to rejoice that the skeleton would accept the offer. But there was an exact refusal from the warrior. The skeleton held up his new sword. He didn't want to be confined to one group. His determination was to be envied. Principal Lime picked up the mug of hot tea with annoyance. He lowered his gaze to hide his disappointment, but was forced to accept that rejection. The warrior skeleton turned his head toward his companion. Lena was enough for him and it is only from her that he will get any information. Hearing this unexpected statement, the girl stared at the skeleton. Seeing the skeleton warrior's gaze on her, she blushed. Her cheeks flamed with embarrassment, and she averted her gaze, covering her face with her hand. Standing in the middle of the huge office, the skeleton decided to find out what Lena needed to do to become a full member of the guild. Director Lime said to either pay or complete a guild assignment. The girl had been silent the whole time. Skeleton chose to pay for guild membership. They just had the gold he'd gotten in the spider's cave. Lena quickly pulled out her bag and started looking for him. They laid out a whole bag of gold coins on the table in front of the principal. Skeleton and the girl hoped that would be enough of an introduction. At the sight of the huge amount of gold, the eyes of the orphanage owner lit up. The money that was in the bag was very much enough. After the principal's words, a blue screen began to light up in front of the skeleton. There's a new notice. The aid from the Shadows script has been updated. Lena is now a full member of the T&T Guild. More information is now available to her. The skeleton will maintain contact with the clan through Lena. The fusion with the dungeon has decreased. The warrior skeleton was pleased to see this notice, but something about him still overshadowed him. Principal Lime took out the papers and approached the companions. After Lena joined the guild, the paperwork formalities had to be done away with. While the principal was explaining the rules of their community to Lena, the skeleton warrior was scrutinizing the notification on the blue screen. He was interested in updating the script. It said that after all the conditions were met, some event would happen. Not understanding what he was talking about, the skeleton decided to wait until the formalities of Lena's entry were over. Skeleton looked at the update screen and thought about what he should do next. The principal was reading Lena the statute. The first clause of the statute required her to report any knowledge of threats to Amber. The warrior skeleton was interested. The name Amber was familiar to him. And what kind of threats were these that Lena should immediately report to the guild? 
Hearing the question, Principal Lime stretched his arms forward in surprise, almost hitting the girl. Yeah, that's what he said about Amber. Lena moved a little away from Lime so that he wouldn't hurt her again. A memory arose in the skeleton warrior's mind. He stood and thought about Amber. It was a city, a fairly developed port city. There were many industrial plants there. Skeleton remembered that it was 20 years before he met Lady Succubus. And soon this port city will be wiped off the face of the earth. It will be taken over by the Freedom Alliance led by the crowned Prince Alton Clements II. It was a great war. Many soldiers died in this battle to seize power. The war lasted a long and agonizing nine years. The town of Amber remained neutral in this war, but it was in the interests of the Empire to rule over a port industrial city. Amber was located between two warring forces, and on the way to victory, this city became the Empire's first bloody target. Skeleton asked why this town was mentioned in the Guild Charter. This question confused both Lena and Principal Lime. This information was classified, but Principal Lime trusted the warrior skeleton and decided to tell. This city was the headquarters of the Guild. The skeleton stood in confusion. He knew a lot of things from his first past life, but he didn't know if he should tell his knowledge now. The warrior skeleton decided not to speak directly, but to come from far away. He decided to ask the principal a question which caught his attention. Skeleton assumed that the Empire, in a war with the Alliance, would want to attack Amber because of its strategic importance. Would this situation constitute a statutory threat to the security of Amber? Principal Lime became serious. He was surprised at the information and that the skeleton was very aware of the Empire's plans. But the skeleton was absolutely right to consider it a threat to the safety of Amber. Amber is both geographically and strategically a good target for the Empire. But the Guild members had already calculated such an option and prepared a good response to any actions of the Empire. Principal Lime stopped talking and returned his attention to the Charter. Skeleton wanted to know what kind of answer they had prepared. But Principal Lime said he wouldn't say more than that. Everything else was kept in strict secrecy. Principal Lime shook hands with a happy Lena. She was finally a full member of the Guild. The girl was very happy and grateful. The skeleton warrior decided not to hesitate. He asked the question head on. How does Lena become a branch manager now? The principal laughed in his opinion. There was no hurry. Lena had just become a member of the guild. Such an onslaught left the girl a little shocked. But the skeleton was persistent. Advancing the girl's career was his priority right now. It was beneficial to both her and him. The expression on Principal Lime's face quickly changed. It's become businesslike. He was picking up an assignment for the companions. And that's the kind of assignment she had. The guild recently received one interesting request. One girl alone will not be able to cope with it, but if the warrior skeleton helps her, Lena will be waiting for a promotion after fulfillment. Lena realized that this assignment was going to be very difficult, possibly fatal. She was scared, and she looked at the warrior waiting to answer with a decision. Principal Lime stood in front of the skeleton waiting for an answer. He liked the persistence of his interlocutor, and he knew that a skeleton warrior would be up to the task. The skeleton stared ahead. It was a difficult and responsible choice. Not only his life was at stake, but the girl's life as well. A choice appeared on the blue screen. Should I accept the offer? Yes? No? People were welcomed by Ramon, the host of the annual tournament. They were in the city of Ariston. The host was a tall, thin man with glasses. He was cheerful and cheerfully called everyone to participate. This annual tournament brought together all the valiant knights, the strongest fighters in the Empire. All have come here to test their strength and honor. Host Ramon was already feeling the general jubilation before the battles himself. Behind the man was the arena. To choose the strongest soldier in the Empire, everyone was wondering who was going to be him. Raising his hand to the sky, Host Ramon was pleased to announce the start of the Arasta City Tournament. The people gathered in the arena rose from the bleachers. They cheered loudly, waving their hands. Men whistled and shouted. The noise could be heard far away from the arena. The men in the stands were well prepared for the tournament. They were wearing armor, and the friends had already had quite a few drinks to make watching the battle more fun. Very few people were dissatisfied with this contest. Perhaps they didn't like the hype that was made about it. Host Ramon introduced the first contestant. 
It was a giant who crumbled his opponents with a huge hammer. He was a member of the Bronze Ring Hiring Company. A huge man appeared in front of the stands, whose clothes had been torn off. But judging by his size, it was very difficult for him to find one. On her head was a huge horned helmet. Smiling broadly, he held a hammer as huge as himself on his shoulders. The man's name was dismembered Jacob Isaac. Seated in the bleachers were friends and members of the Giacote gang. They all shouted for him to tear up his opponents. They even bet all their money on him. He had better not lose and set his friends up. Host Ramon looked carefully at the list. Jacot's opponent was a contestant who was making his first appearance in this arena to compete. A man in a cloak appeared at the entrance. The sun reflected his face, and only his silhouette was visible. He shouted that he would bring glory to his people in Genet. It was a warrior, a skeleton in all his gear and valor. He was introduced as Sir Jagan. The warrior's armor gleamed in the sun, and his statuesque appearance looked very warlike. Host Ramon shouted out the preparations of the participants for battle. The skeleton warrior drew his sword from its sheath, and Jacoth Isaac lowered his hammer ready to strike. Host Ramon lowered his hand sharply with a shout of the start of the contest. The skeleton warrior stood still in a fighting stance, and Jacoth rushed with all his might at his opponent. He ran so fast that his surroundings were obliterated. He saw only his goal in front of him and prepared to raise his hammer to crush it. The skeleton drew his sword forward in anticipation and the approach of his opponent. He didn't seem at all afraid that the big guy might kill him. A tremendous amount of dust rose from the ground. It was Jakot Isaac who pushed himself harder and jumped up. He intended to launch his airstrike right on the enemy's head. The skeleton warrior watched his opponent's movements carefully and was ready to repel any blow. The shadow of a huge heavy hammer was already looming over the skeleton warrior's helmet. It's about to hit. I don't think the skeleton's gonna make it. The impact was quick and loud. As the hammer made contact with the target, sparks sprinkled in different directions. The sound was so loud it sounded like a bomb went off. Before the tournament begins, the skeleton warrior holds a letter of invitation to the tournament. This letter entitles the holder to become a participant in the tournament. It was a request from one of the families in Jinai. They would like to hire someone to play in the tournament for them. Skeleton didn't understand how the head of the household could allow a stranger to fight for their family's honor. Doesn't Genii have any knights of her own? The director explained that this family was preoccupied with trading operations instead of training knights. They achieved their title by accumulating wealth through the leather business and trade. They want to hire a decent fighter to avoid pressure from the tournament sponsor. Warrior. Skeleton clarified what kind of sponsor this tournament has. The director, looking at the papers, replied that it was Lord Arasta. The name was like lightning that pierced the skeleton's memories. This lord was from the Ray family and was the younger brother of the late lord. In Director Lime's hand was the Jinya family's contract with their knight. They offered to pay two Siron for each victory, but after passing the eighth round at no additional cost. It seemed fair to the director, after all. They were only hiring a warrior for themselves and didn't want to draw attention to themselves. Director Lamb turned to his interlocutor and repeated his question. He wondered if the warrior, the skeleton, would accept the assignment. The brown horse tromped slowly down the road. She had to pull the heavy wagon behind her. On the edge of the wagon holding on tightly and in complete silence rode a skeleton. Behind him lay Hay. Lena was also riding with him. She was very thoughtful. Na leaned on the edge of the wagon, and her thoughts seemed to scream and make her uncomfortable. The silence was broken only by the owner of the wagon. He was quietly humming some kind of tune. A long distance past mountains and forests, they were all alone, two quarreling friends, a horse and its master. The girl and the skeleton didn't look at each other. Everyone is absorbed in their own thoughts. The Ray family in Erasta, it was like a skeleton mockumentary. Erastus was Rubia's hometown. This lord was Rubia's uncle, and most likely the same lord who killed his older brother and tried to kill his only niece. Skeleton thought about whether or not he should kill this lord. Unexpectedly, Lena decided to start a conversation. She wanted to talk to the skeleton warrior about that girl, Rubia. She still did not look at her interlocutor. She did not take her gaze away from the trees passing by. Lena wanted to talk about the one who bought the warrior this armor he wore. The girl needed to know who this Rubia was to the skeleton warrior.
The warrior skeleton turned to Lena. He looked at her and repeated what he had said last time. There was nothing between him and Rubia. Lena kept up. She was interested in many things. So she asked what kind of girl was Rubia. But the skeleton didn't realize which side he needed to approach the matter from. Lena stared thoughtfully ahead, resting her head on her hand. She thought of Rubia as an interesting person. The wheels squeaked as they moved. Lena spoke her thoughts aloud. She thought Rubia's skeleton would have answered differently. The warrior skeleton sat up straight. He didn't know what to say to his companion. Her nighttime image appeared before his eyes. How earnestly the girl had asked him to stay with her. How open she was back then. Skeleton replied to Lena. He said no. At the unexpected answer, the girl turned her face toward him. Even Rubia's skeleton responded in the same way as Lena. The girl lowered her head sadly, sinking into her thoughts after the unexpected answer. The skeleton warrior suddenly said that he needed to do some business. Lena didn't know how to react or what to say to the warrior. She liked that the skeleton would answer Rubia the same way, and she smiled slightly without raising her head. The wagon master turned to his passengers. He turned to the girl and warned her that they were almost there. Erastus could already be seen in front of them. Lena raised her head at the sound of the voice and looked ahead. A poster hung in front of the stone walls. It had a huge inscription on it that said that this was where Erastus's tournament was being held. There was a huge line in front of the entrance. There were all kinds of people there, men, women, and children. People came in families and companies to see such an event. The line was so long that the people at the end of it couldn't see the entrance. Everyone was preparing for the event, and many workers were walking past guests with boxes and tools to prepare for the tournament. In this huge, slow line stood Lena and the skeleton. Lena scrutinized everything around her. She was amazed at the sheer number of people who came here. This event was very popular. Suddenly, Lena heard a shout from the tent out front. A man was yelling and calling for participants. He shouted about needing people who had gotten a letter of invitation from the Ray family. The girl quickly ran up to the tent and announced that she wanted to check in. Such a statement left the owner of the tent confused. The man looked at the girl and could not believe that she was going to participate in the tournament. And he asked her if she was sure of her decision. But then the skeleton appeared in his huge, shiny armor. He motioned his companion over and announced that he would be the participant. The man asked where the warrior was from. The skeleton handed him a letter of invitation and told him that he came from Jinya. An elderly man rose from his seat and opened a huge account book. He spent a long time running his fingers over the pages and turning them in search of the Genesee family. And I finally found it. There was a record of such a family's participation. The coat of arms of the Genesee family was a huge eagle. Such a seal was in the book. The man, having made sure that the warrior in front of him could really participate, said that it was now necessary to register and asked what the warrior's name was. But the skeleton didn't have a name. He never thought about what name he had or what name he wanted to carry. The man, pen in hand, was still waiting for the name of the participant to be registered. The skeleton questioned the shopkeeper in desperation. Should he tell him his name? The man rudely replied that, yes, that was a prerequisite. The warrior skeleton stood, choosing his words. He didn't know what his name was. The older man was starting to get angry. He stared menacingly at the warrior, waiting for his name to be called. He shifted his eyebrows to his nose and prepared to scream in anger if the man didn't identify himself. Lena was frightened by the shopkeeper's fierce appearance and began to quickly think of something to calm him down with. The warrior skeleton was still as silent as ever. She walked over to the bench and tried to calm the owner down. She said the warrior was very shy and laughed. The man relaxed his face a little. And then the girl and the man heard the name, Jagan. They both turned toward the skeleton to make sure he was the one who called his name. A skeleton stood next to the tent and looked at the people who were staring at him. No one, not even he himself, had expected to give his name. The warrior skeleton repeated his name once more. His name was Sayer Jagan. Screams could be heard from behind the high stone walls. Someone was calling out to the tournament participants. Down below that wall stood a stunned Lena. She couldn't believe her companion's name and called him by his familiar title, Warrior. Many people crowded around the companions. Everyone was getting ready for the tournament to begin, and all the girl cared about was that the skeleton warrior had a name. 
but the skeleton said it wasn't. That's not his name. The warrior skeleton crouched down and picked up his sword. He pulled out a rag and started polishing it. Lena didn't understand how it wasn't his name, but the skeleton made up that name for the sake of registering for the tournament. While the girl was busy coming up with a name for the warrior, the skeleton thought about what would happen to a weakened humanity after the war. Sixteen demon lords will descend upon mankind and chaos will ensue. People are going to start freaking out. They will die and the corpses of the humans will form a throne for the demons. The name the skeleton called was a compound name. The part of Seer belonged to one of the sixteen demons of the destroyer Sira. And the second, Jagan, he took from a ferocious minotaur. The warrior, the skeleton looking at his reflection in his sword, he hoped there wouldn't be a problem with him using their names. In fact, the skeleton warrior had never once seen the demon lords in person. Even among the monster army, the skeleton was at the bottom of the hierarchy. He lived like a regular necromancer doll, and his life was an absolute hell. He was living like a perpetual nightmare. But one day, among the hordes of skeletons, a beautiful mistress appeared near the dungeon wall. It was his beloved lady Succubus. He remembers her as if she were real. It is majestic and beautiful, and her kind, bright smile was on her face. Skeleton can't imagine what would have happened to him if they hadn't met. Lena asked the pensive skeleton what his real name was then. The skeleton raised its head and looked at the girl. She never wasted time, always talking about what she cared about at the moment. Lena scratched the back of her head shyly. She never thought there was another talking skeleton, and his name had never mattered to her. But the skeleton warrior didn't know his name. This turn of events made the girl think about her words. The skeleton rose from his seat. His broad back was manly, but even he never knew his name. The fact that no one knew the skeleton's name pleased Lena. Now she could come up with a name for the warrior herself. Skeleton decided to talk her out of it. He was doing quite well without a name. The name suggested were all skull-related. Black Skull, Captain Skull, Iron Skull, and so on. While the girl stood there thinking up ridiculous names for her interlocutor, someone said hello to the tournament participants. There were two men standing near the entrance to the preparation area. A security guard and a second man in a white suit that looked like a cook. He announced that the competition would begin tomorrow, but now they would be offered lunch and given restrooms. The man in white loudly continued his announcement. If tournament participants need anything outside the castle, they just need to tell the organizers. The skeleton warrior listened to all this and thought about the fact that Rubia had once lived in this castle. When one of the organizers finished his speech and headed for the exit, the skeleton ran after him. He started to stop him. The man was intimidated by such a push from one of the participants, but the skeleton was interested in where the library was located here. The male organizer looked at the warrior strangely. He didn't understand why he needed the library. The skeleton answered simply. The library had what he was looking for. The library was a huge room. Tall shelves were filled with books. A tall ladder was needed to get the books from the top shelf. A nice older lady was surprised when she was told that one of the tournament participants was interested in the library. She thought family nights were much more different from the rest. The woman turned slightly toward the warrior and offered her assistance. He may be looking for a particular book, and she may be able to help him find it faster. Skeleton was interested in books written by Kevin Ashton. Walking between the bookshelves, the library curator noticed that she was not familiar with the name of this writer. But she promised to look and help in the search. The skeleton looked at the bookcases. He had never seen so many of them in one place. He was fascinated by the library. But among the vast number of books, the warrior skeleton found dust. There were cobwebs hanging all over the ceiling. There was so much of her that the top shelves of books were just as much in it. It was very dirty. Looks like no one's been watching this place. A book fell next to the warrior's feet. She fell with a loud thud and so hard that dust rose from the floor. The warrior skeleton raised its head upward back to where it had fallen from, and took the image of the girl on the stairs away. The girl's hair was red and reminded the warrior of a cute image. There was a ladder near a large bookcase. On the top step sat a little girl in a yellow dress. The red-haired girl was putting the books in their places. Taking out one of the books, she held it gently in her hands, reading the title. 
As she read, her face was turned around so the skeleton could see who she was. The warrior skeleton kept looking at this image and couldn't believe what he was seeing. The girl who was sitting on the stairs amongst the huge number of books was Rubia. She was quite unlike the one the skeleton had met in the woods. This one was calm, youthful, and beautiful. She was passionate about reading books, not running away to survive. While the skeleton warrior was looking at the image that had suddenly appeared, the keeper of the library approached him. She found Kevin Ashton's book. They had one of his short stories. Slightly startled by the woman's sudden appearance, the skeleton lowered its head. The woman handed him a book in a thick green cover. The title of the novella sounded like The Splitting of Time. The skeleton gratefully accepted it. Upon receiving the long-awaited publication, the skeleton scrutinized the information on the cover. It was the book specifically by writer Kevin Ashton that brought him wisdom points. The keeper of the library stood beside the warrior in case her help was still needed. But the skeleton warrior raised his head sharply upward, hoping to see the image of the girl again. But there was an empty ladder standing lonely next to the closet. The skeleton warrior looked sadly at the spot where he had seen Rubia a moment ago but she didn't show up again. The library keeper noticed the red-covered book that lay at the warrior's feet. How could she have ended up on the floor? Picking the book up off the floor, the woman shook the dust off it. She looked sadly at the book and said that the person who had read it was no longer there, and now the book was left to gather dust. Skeleton heard the woman talking about Rubia and approaching her from behind, asked what kind of person was reading it. The keeper of the library was very frightened by the appearance of the warrior. She was deep in her thoughts. The library keeper tried to change the subject. She apparently said something stupid and asked me to ignore her. She also warned that the book must be returned before the warrior left the city. Placing the book on the shelf, the woman abruptly snapped out of her seat and ran about her business, not wanting to continue the conversation. The skeleton tried to stop her, but the woman was already gone and the warrior skeleton was left all alone in an empty library among a huge number of books. He realized he wouldn't learn anything more and looked at the book he had been handed. He decided to read it while he had time. Carefully holding it in his hands, the skeleton turned page after page, devouring the words that were written there and soon reached the middle of the book. Over the reading, dusk had fallen over the city and all the houses were engulfed in the night sky. The skeleton leaned against a cabinet and read. It wrote about time. The author of the book wanted to know, can time really stop? Leak anew and repeat? Is time real, or does it exist only in the author's subconscious? The author was wondering if anyone else has this kind of consciousness. Since it was only a novella, it was a very quick and easy read. The content itself was voluminous, though. Lena burst into the library. She was very cheerful, as usual. She was looking for a skeleton warrior. Hearing the girl, the warrior was distracted from reading the book. Lena said that she had found out where the skeleton warrior's room was, and it was time for them to go back. The skeleton slammed the book shut loudly and dust flew up from it. Yeah, it was time to go. But then a blue screen with a notification appeared in front of him, and he stopped to read it. It said that his dungeon absorption level was below 90%. He was able to learn about Kevin Ashton's first hidden particle and earned ten wisdom points. The skeleton can now sense individuals of its own species, the skeleton. The insight level has been raised to E. The skeleton didn't expect wisdom to increase by ten points at once, and he would gain a new ability. Noticing that the skeleton warrior had stopped paying attention to her and was looking at the book, Lena pouted her lips and asked to hurry up. She's tired. The skeleton came out of his thoughts and turned his attention to the girl. But looking at the girl, he froze in surprise. A belligerent Lena stood in front of him, and above her was a blue screen with a new notification. Lena, a level 15 thief, all vital and military stats were above 20, predisposition to skeletal level 40. A sword was flying in the air, the movements were so fast, it was impossible to keep track of where he was. The warrior skeleton was walking down a huge corridor and practicing wielding his sword. With another step and a wave of his hand, a blue screen appeared in front of him. He's been showing up a lot lately because of events. Stopping, the skeleton decided to take a break from his workout and read what the screen would show him this time. His vitals were there. The space for the skeleton's name, as always, was left blank. His level was 23rd or hidden 65th. 
His passive abilities were level 5 swordsmanship, but his speed was only level 1. The skeleton was worried about the swordsmanship skill. He didn't want to grow up at all. The skeleton warrior wanted to know what the limit of this ability was, but apparently normal training wouldn't tell him, and he was also worried about the bonus insight. Lena ran toward the warrior down the hallway. She was disturbed about something and was calling loudly for him. The girl urged him to hurry. It has already been announced that the tournament is about to begin. Lena was excited. To the shouts of the announcer and volleys of fireworks, the girl and the skeleton ran out onto the platform. The host would announce the start of the tournament, and the person in charge of the event would take the stage. Lord Rye came out. Hearing that name, the skeleton stopped. The host called for a round of applause for the Lord for giving them such a spectacle, and the skeleton thought about wanting to kill this man. Lord Rye was at the very top of the bleachers, as if showing his superiority over the rest of the people. Lena and the skeleton standing on the balcony could see him perfectly well. Lord Rye was not a young man with blonde, long hair and the same beard. His face expressed contempt for everyone around him. The haughty look spoke of his superiority. He was dressed in a long robe and had a crown on his head, and around him stood guards guarding an important person. Lena raised her eyes upward and looked at the one who was the Lord. She was delighted to see such a man so close. The skeleton looked at his enemy in silence. Following Lord Rye spotted a warrior in blue armor and he eyed him intently, but the man's face didn't show a drop of emotion. That Lord was Rubia's uncle, the one who tried to kill her. The skeleton tried to remember this man and seek revenge. Erastus's first battle of the qualifying tournament begins. The stands roared with anticipation. People stood up and waved their hands in anticipation of the fights. The sounds of swords clashing against each other could already be heard in the air. The skeleton warrior looked at the battles taking place and thought about the fact that the prize was apparently something worthwhile. Everyone involved in the battle was putting their best foot forward, but the prize was just a ceremonial sword with the seal of a lord. Skeleton didn't understand why they would put their lives on the line for some toy, but the purpose of this competition was more than a prize, Lena said cryptically. In fact, these small skirmishes, which were called a competition, were an occasion to show how strong the families were. So the young warriors put their best foot forward to show their family's strength. While the soldiers were fighting in the arena, Lena and the skeleton were discussing about this being a great way to increase their importance and ranking to these soldiers. They have no other occupation than fighting. This is a great opportunity for the knights, singles to show up. These knights as unemployed do not serve any family. Therefore, such a tournament is a great chance to show themselves so that they will be noticed by a noble family and invited to join them. Behind the girl in golden armor stood a soldier. He stood in the shadows so that he could not be seen and watched the warrior and Lena. Only after the words were spoken did the girl realize how it might have sounded to the skeleton warrior. She turned to him and started apologizing, but her words made no difference to the warrior. That's when one of the tournament organizers came in. He called out to Sir Seer Jagan. He was next. Preparations had to be made. As the skeleton warrior walked away following the organizer, the girl shouted supportive words to him. She wanted him to beat everyone in the arena. But the skeleton warrior quietly said as he left that he planned not to stand out among the other participants of the tournament. Looking in the wake of her warrior, Lena thought about what a joker he was. He's the best of the lot. He can't help but stand out. And so the warrior skeleton stood in the middle of the huge arena. Opposite him stood his opponent, and from the high bleachers, Spectators looked on in anticipation of the battle. Everything is ready for the contest to begin. Host Ramon repeated the rules of the contest. The fight lasts until one of them loses the ability to fight. The fight can also end if one of the contestants goes over the edge of the arena. The skeleton standing in the middle of the arena assessed the situation. While on the battlefield, he realized that the arena platform was much wider than he thought, and pushing his opponent over the edge would become problematic. The skeleton warrior's opponent did not consider him a worthy opponent. He looked down at him, and he couldn't understand how such a scrawny freak could be a knight of the royal family. Jakoth Isaac thought about how he could easily nail this warrior with his smashing hammer, and the royal family would make him a knight of the family. 
He looked at his opponent and smiled. The warrior skeleton continued his assessment. This time, he turned his attention to his opponent. He had a huge hammer in his hands, too big for a human, and the man across from the skeleton was not small in size. He decided to see if he was as strong as he looked. A blue screen appeared above Jacket Isaac. The power of discernment was utilized. While that huge subhuman smirked, the warrior calculated the steps to victory. Jacoth Isaac's abilities appeared on the blue screen. He was a 22nd level warrior. Health was level 56 and strength was level 35, and the dexterity and wisdom of the 15th. The warrior skeleton was ready to attack, and that's the moment before the punch. Jaikoth Isaac flies straight at the warrior, ready to crush him with a single blow of his hammer, and the skeleton stands ready to repel the attack. Jaikoth Isaac with a cry, Die puts down his hammer, he's confident of winning with one punch. The people in the bleachers rose from their seats. They scream and cheer at the transience of this battle, from a nice jump shot there by Jacob Isaacs. The skeleton warrior holds his sword firmly in his hands. His opponent is huge, but also very slow. A huge cloud of dust rose from Jackot Isaac's collision with the ground. Because of the density, there was no way to see what was going on, but it was clear from the rumble that it was over. A huge dent appeared in the arena platform. The stones that made up the arena cracked into small pieces. Jackot Isaac smiled. All he could think about was what an easy victory this was. His hammer pinned his opponent to the ground. But as soon as the dust began to return to the ground, what he saw startled the man. Jacot Isaac's huge hammer was broken. All that was left in the man's hands was a pen, and the stone hammer itself lay on the empty arena. There was no enemy beneath him, only shattered rocks. Jacot Isaac was ready to weep at the breakage of his hammer. He couldn't believe that one had broken. He wondered how this could have happened. And the skeleton warrior was already standing at the other end of the arena. He still held his sword in his hands. The skeleton was unharmed. The warrior skeleton crushed his opponent without touching him or inflicting bodily harm. He defeated him with agility and speed. An angry Jacoth Isaac glared at his opponent. He didn't notice his movements. How could he be there? How did he stay in one piece? Such questions were swirling around in the man's mind. Jacoth Isaac could not believe that the warrior in front of him had broken his hammer and moved to the other side of the arena in such a short time. The hammer, as well as the stones of the arena, were broken into pieces. The skeleton warrior offered his opponent to surrender since he was unarmed. The two opponents stood in the middle of the arena and looked at each other. But Jacot Isaac didn't plan to give up. He was too angry after losing his weapon, and he doesn't need it to kill someone like his opponent. The skeleton's words sounded too arrogant for him. Jacot Isaac's weapon was his strength, and he lunged again to attack the skeleton warrior standing before him. Jacoth Isaac aimed his fist precisely at the skeleton's head, and his hand flew right at the target, but the warrior's speed was to be envied. In a split second, he took his head out of the fist's trajectory. The skeleton warrior had no choice but to use his sword. At the moment when Jacoth Isaac was still delivering his blow to the skeleton's face, the warrior jumped out from under him and struck the handle of his sword right on the back of Jacoth Isaac's head. The blow was apt and Jacot Isaac lost his balance and began to fall. From the pain that Jacot Isaac felt at the impact, his eyes were ready to fly out of his eye sockets. I think he's about to pass out. The huge man fell into the arena with a violent rumble. He was unconscious and could no longer move. And the warrior, skeleton stood there, not feeling the slightest bit of fatigue or pain. A solitary soldier who had been watching the battle was amazed at such a magnificent fight. The presenter even fixed his glasses from the fact that he couldn't believe what he was seeing. And the people cheering in the stands fell silent, mouths open in surprise. The skeleton warrior didn't want to spill blood in the arena in front of people. Seeing blood can panic onlookers. The warrior skeleton stood in front of his opponent who was still unconscious. Host Ramon counted down the seconds to the end of the fight. If Jacob Isaac doesn't get up, this fight is over. When time was up, the skeleton hurried the referee to give the results of the fight. Host Ramon raised his hands in the air and shouted for the winners so that even from the farthest rows of bleachers could hear. The winner was Seer Jagan. The spectators in the stands roared loudly. The skeleton stood in the middle of the arena mesmerized by these voices. 
The skeleton warrior twisted his head around and listened. He didn't realize what kind of reaction those screams were getting. Standing on the balcony where the skeleton had left her was Lena. Though the skeleton planned to keep a low profile, he failed. After the first fight, he left a good impression on the audience. On the blue screen was the next opponent's data. The name is Edward Klein, a level 17 fighter. Health on the 27th, dexterity is level 36, wisdom is 7, strength is 15. A man was attacking a skeleton warrior with spears. He was thin and fast. He was dressed no better than the previous one and looked like an outlaw with a helmet. Still, the warrior was faster. While Edward Collin was running in his attack, the warrior skeleton was right in front of him. The sudden appearance of his opponent made Edward stall and startle. With a quick movement of his hand, the skeleton warrior flipped his sword over and stabbed his opponent in the stomach with the hilt. From the intense, sharp pain, Edward Collin began to cough. He couldn't keep his balance and fell into the arena with a heavy sack. The only thing left for the skeleton warrior was to step aside and not interfere with the fall. The people in the stands cheered. They rose from their seats and shouted to the new champion. They liked the way the warrior skeleton conducted his fights. The skeleton's next opponent was Gene Phillip. He was a 29th level warrior. Health is 42nd level, strength is 31st level, dexterity is 8th level, and wisdom is 2nd level. This opponent was not tall, but of a rather large build. His weapon of choice was a dagger, a thick and sharp arrow on a long chain. He waved it around like a ribbon. The warrior skeleton was confident of his victory. He stood still without a shadow of a doubt and with a single sword motion, he caught the chain of the dagger, winding it around the sword point. Jean Philip didn't yet realize what was happening. He pulled the chain toward him with a strong jerk, confident that his intended move would succeed. But the warrior skeleton wouldn't let him. His sword was strong and his hands stronger, and instead of giving in to the tug, he pulled the sword with the coiled chain towards him. With an effort with both hands, he pulled the man by that chain as well. Jean Philip could not stay in place and flew with his castenia towards the skeleton warrior. The warrior skeleton loosened the grip of her sword so that the chain fell off her. And Jean Philip fell on his back. He lay in the arena, pinned down by his weapon, and passed out from the pain without a drop of blood or bodily injury. The people loved it. Even the girls were thrilled to watch. Everyone enthusiastically shouted and cheered for the warrior. People in the bleachers jumped up from their seats. They cheered the winner. And once again, it was a skeleton warrior. All of his opponents found themselves lying unconscious in the middle of the arena, and he was only glad to hear the shouts of approval and to see that those who fought him were without unnecessary damage. The warrior skeleton looked up after each victory at those who cheered him, and every time he was convinced he was doing the right thing. During one of the breaks between battles, the skeleton keeping his back straight headed for his room walking down a wide hallway. He reflected that the skill of discernment was very handy. He can now see the characteristics of his opponents and controlling his power has become much easier. Warrior was worried about who this Kevin Ashton was and how could he leave such a skill in a book. Hearing the girl's screams, the skeleton stopped. Further down the hall, Lena stood and was surrounded by three older men. They grabbed her arms and pulled her toward them. The girl was breaking free from their shackles as best she could. Men were constantly grabbing her with their hands. Their lustful smiles grew wider and wider, and Lena would deny them, she said of the warrior. The warrior skeleton came closer and asked loudly what was going on here. The girl was glad to see him and immediately moved toward him. But three older men stepped forward and made their way to Sir Sayer Jagan. They wanted to have a word with him. Lena was glad to stop talking to them and remained quietly standing to the side. All three said hello and introduced themselves. They were happy to see Sir Jagan. The bald, full man with the mustache was Bernard from Lienza. Behind him on his left, a thin, dark-haired man was Mulun of Kibera. And on the right, the full and gray-haired man was from the Villa family. Bernard of Lienza took the warrior's hands in his own, apologized for addressing him in such a manner, but he would like to offer the skeleton warrior a place in his guard. The unexpected question made the skeleton take a step back. Maloon of Kibera wanted to interrupt Bernard's offer and shouted that he would double his salary if he agreed. And a man from the Villa family promised to triple and provide a plot of land. They all wanted a skeleton warrior for their guards. 
The warrior skeleton was surprised at this behavior. They behaved like hustlers in the marketplace. Carefully removing the noble's hands, the skeleton said that this conversation was pointless. Men don't even know what his salary is. What kind of allowances can we talk about? The men realized their mistake. They quieted down and lowered their heads in respect. They promised not to hurt him with money anyway. The skeleton warrior stood with his back to the nobles and firmly said that he wasn't interested in money. The warrior skeleton slowly, emphasizing each word, began to talk about the one thing he was interested in. The three noble men froze in anticipation of his recognition. Everyone wondered what interested a warrior more than money. The warrior skeleton proudly straightened his back, not turning fully towards the nobles muttered that only Jinai mattered to him. The skeleton proudly pronounced what they needed to remember, the fact that he would never turn his back on the genii family. Lena stood behind the warrior and rejoiced at the handsome way he had refused the insolent nobles. Bernard of Lienza realized the hopelessness of the situation, but still mumbled that he might reconsider his decision in their favor. They will hope so. There was a man's shout, he mouth wide open and yelling about how all humans are noisy as hell. His hair was long and hid his eyes. In one corner behind a column, a sleepy man stood up. The nobles turned around at the shouts and glared at whoever they had disturbed from sleeping. The man was drunk. There was a liquor bottle lying beside him. He was hiccuping as he spoke, and his face was red from sleep and alcohol. He talked about how the waiting room for participants was like a market stall. The waiting room for the participants was guarded by guards. A drunken man ordered them to escort the nobles out. Because of the noise they made, he as a participant cannot rest. The guards stood in awkward silence. The warrior, a skeleton, and Lena stood beneath the columns and watched as the guards led Bernard out of Lienza, Mulun of Kibera, and a gray-haired man was from the Vilja family. Beside the disgruntled soldier stood a sword. A sleepy man picked up an unfinished bottle of liquor and swore at the nobles. Because of those damn men, he won't be able to sleep now. The skeleton warrior was interested in the man and asked the girl, Who is it? The girl glared at the soldier who was drinking before the fight. It was the warrior's next opponent, the skeleton muttered to her. The drunken man ordered the guard to approach him, and the skeleton couldn't believe he'd have to fight a drunk. How did a man like that even make it to the quarterfinals? But the skeleton warrior decided to use his ability of discernment and proceeded to assess his opponent. While the drunken man argued with the guards, the skeleton studied the inscriptions on the blue screen that appeared above his head. His name was Tabald Reynold. This is the only information that was available for the evaluation. The information the warrior skeleton saw puzzled him greatly. He didn't understand why he couldn't see his stats, and the drunken man, still sitting on the bench, tried to get the guard to approach him. The warrior skeleton decided to try once more to use his ability of clairvoyance. He put his fingers to his temples, thinking it would work better that way. But no other information appeared on the blue screen. His opponent's name was Theobald Reynold, and information about strength, health, agility, and wisdom was still just as absent. The skeleton warrior looked puzzled at his opponent. He didn't understand why the other information never showed up. Theobald Reynold laughed while talking to the guard. He was amused by the information about his opponent. But even though they had a fight coming up, the man wouldn't let the bottle of alcohol out of his hands. Erastus' quarterfinal battle was beginning. Introduce the skeleton warrior. He is the newcomer who came out of nowhere, the newcomer that Sir Jagan has managed to win the hearts of the audience. And his opponent is the incredibly fast Sir Tabald Reynold. Apparently the skeleton's opponent was very ill from the huge amount of alcohol he drank shortly before the tournament. Tebald Reynold could barely contain his pressure and turned to the host Ramon. He urgently needed the nearest restroom. Host Ramon couldn't let him leave the arena. The battle is about to begin but it seems his name was Theobald Reynold is about to burst with little need. The warrior skeleton was still thinking about why the discernment skill wasn't working. While his name was Tabald Reynold, and host Ramon argued about where and when a contestant should go to relieve his or her need. The host stood his ground. It was too late to leave the arena. Host Ramon apologized to viewers for the slight delay. As of right now, both competitors are ready for the fight. As soon as the announcer shouted the start of the competition, the skeleton warrior rushed from his seat, wanting to strike the first blow to his opponent. He was sure that even without discernment, he would have no problem with the alcoholic. 
The man in front of the warrior could barely stay on his feet. Meanwhile, the skeleton was approaching him at the speed of light. Tabald Reynold's eyes were black because of the shadow of hair that hung straight down over his face. All he could think about at this time was that he needed to go to the restroom. The skeleton warrior approached his opponent and raised his sword high above his head. It's going to be over now. But a drunken man in a semi-conscious state fought off the attack. The speed of his resistance was so fast that only the glint of a moving sword was visible. The warrior skeleton had no time to notice any movement. He could only see the glow that the sword gave off and he had to stop. The opponent that stood in front of him after the repelled attack got into a stance like a true swordsman, and nothing but his face and his dangling facial hair gave him away as a drunkard. Tabald Reynolds' eyes expressed the hopelessness of the situation. He had no choice but to go to the restroom after the fight was over. The man snatched up his sword and demonstrated the first move of imperial swordsmanship. The movements were so fast that it was impossible to keep track. The tip of the sword was already near the skeleton's helmet. He barely had time to notice the weapons approaching. The skeleton warrior raised the sword in front of him and held it tightly with both hands. His feet skidded across the arena looking for a place to break. It was carried so far from the impact that it left deep footprints on the pad along the way. Dust has kicked up and visibility is down. There was steam coming from his sword. The skeleton warrior barely managed to repel the attack and block his opponent's deadly blow. Theobald Reynolds glared at his standing opponent. He seemed surprised at how he managed to fend off the attack. Raising his sword, the man admitted that his opponent was better than he expected. Theobald Reynolds put some effort into his jab to end it in one. The warrior, the skeleton now realized why his ability of clairvoyance gave him no information. Theobald Reynold decided to see how the skeleton warrior would block his next attack and quickly disappeared from where he stood. The warrior skeleton tried to keep his guard up, but his disappearance stunned him. He didn't have time to notice which way it flew. From above, a skeleton warrior was attacked by a swordsman. He used the imperial swordsmanship of the first level of the fifth form. The man was approaching the skeleton very quickly. The man stood still waiting to attack. The movements of Tabald Reynolds' sword were impossible to predict. She was everywhere and nowhere at the same time. The man threw quick and accurate punches, not allowing his opponent to decide how and where to deflect the blow. All of Tabald Reynolds' abilities were on an entirely different level, beyond the comprehension of a skeleton warrior. Tabald Reynolds seemed to be completely unaffected by alcohol during his sword strokes. His sword struck in all deadly places and the blows could cause serious wounds to the average man. The skeleton warrior was constantly stepping back. He couldn't match such speed and reflect his opponent's blows. The warrior skeleton held the sword in front of his face and staggered with each strike. Every movement was incredibly powerful and precise. And Theobald Reynolds was glad to have found a worthy opponent in this wilderness. He liked that the warrior across from him could block his blows. But Tabald Reynolds was sure that the skeleton warrior lacked combat experience, and despite the possibility of deflecting the sword, he would not be able to reflect it all the time. One of the man's blows knocked the skeleton warrior off balance, and he began to fall. Falling into the arena, the skeleton saw Theobald Reynolds calculating where to deliver his final killing blow and it was one of the unprotected places in the armor under the armpit. A quick movement of the hand with the sword, and it flies right into the target under the skeleton warrior's armor. A startled Lena gets up from her seat. It was a death blow to her partner. 